Hi, good evening. So this is the January 2020 and Happy New Year, everyone, meeting of Community Board 8. I'm happy to see everybody. Again, the first three rows are for members of Community Board 8. We're going to start with the public session. Anyone who wants to speak needs to sign up outside. I'll call you up uh, three at a time, and you'll each have three minutes, two minutes to speak. Sorry, two minutes. And then um, after that, we'll have the elected officials speak, and then we'll move into the executive session of the board. Once we move into the executive session, any, public mem any member of the public who would like to speak must get a board member to speak for them. That's why the board members sit in the first three rows. Okay, so everyone can take their seats and we can get started. So I'd like to call up the public member, I'm, I'm sorry, members of the public. We have Ruth Bish, Hassan Egelral, I, and I'm sorry, I am so bad at names. And Jean Greenberg Rowiton. Jeannie Greenberg Rowiton. If you could just line up behind the microphone. Was that on? I don't know. Was that on? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Not yet. Can you see when it works when I make it click with the name on the agenda? Okay, if you are are you Ruth Beach? Yes. Okay, go right. You might want to swing around and face everybody. Okay. Thank you. And you can just get started. Right. Thank you. I'm Ruth Beach, um, Senior Deputy Director at the Jewish Museum. Um, on January 13th, um, representatives of the museum met with the Landmarks Committee um, to present a proposal for an artwork by Lawrence Wiener. Um, we have heard um, and taken very seriously the concerns of the Landmarks Committee, and so we are going to be reviewing and revising revising our proposal and we will come back to the committee later with um, some new suggestions. Thank you very much. It's always gratifying when we work together with applicants in that way. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Hassan el -Gari, and I'm uh, here to represent Terminus uh, Restaurant LLC doing business as Orsay. I'm um, here to ask for the renewal of our enclosed sidewalk cafe. No changes, same as before. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Don't go away, though. Okay, and Jeannie, are you here? Great. Come on up. Where are you? There you are. Okay. So, hello, my name is Jeannie Greenberg Rowiton. I have been um, a resident uh, of the Upper East Side on 12 East 94th Street for um, nearly two decades. Um, tonight, you will vote on the, uh, a Landmarks Committee resolution regarding the restoration and expansion of 3 East 89th, uh, designed by Ogden Codman in 1914 as part of the former Academy of um, national design. And my goal is really to consolidate uh, three Salon 94 galleries into this one space, across from the Guggenheim and a block from the Cooper Hewitt. Uh, my team and I are restoring this building according to the standards of a 7-4-7-11 process with the goal of giving it a new life as a gallery. Uh, to separate 3 East 89th Street from the former Academy buildings, the design includes um, the addition of basic mechanical systems. As well, we wish to incorporate a modest artist residence, uh, which we really do feel is a much needed um, um, uh, space for the New York City art community. I want to emphasize that our gallery is free and open to the public with museum quality exhibitions. Uh, we, have, um, we show artists that have appeared in MoMA, at the Whitney, um, many renowned institutions all over the year. Um, I just returned from Paris where Judy Chicago uh, just did an enormous collaboration with Christian Dior um, about uh, what happens if women rule the world. Um, so over the past six months, uh, our team has reached out to a number of neighbors and the local uh, and the local civic groups to tour our space. We've been very transparent about our plans. We've listened to your feedback, and we've discussed how the gallery can be a vibrant asset to the community. Um, 
We presented to the CBA Landmarks Committee in December, and after hearing from members and neighbors, we took the next month to significantly scale back our proposal. We returned to this committee in January, and um, with a revised design respectful to historic character while allowing the building to have a, a new viable chapter um, as an artistic enterprise. While aspects of our application were not endorsed by the committee, we are grateful to the committee's diligent review and for your comments by several of the members um, and that the changes we made were significant and meaningful as a result. Uh, so we respectfully ask for your support um, both as uh, art and small business, as well as the preservation of Three East 89th Street, and that you support our application. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Stuart Beckerman, Sarah Schur, and Jim Hare. Her? Hare? Good evening. Uh, I'm Stuart Beckerman. I am uh, the zoning and land use attorney for 3 East 89th Street. You just heard from the owner, Jeannie Greenberg Rowatin. Uh, first, I want to thank the Landmarks uh, Committee uh, because thanks to their input, our project has been uh, substantially revised. The owner, as you heard, takes your and the community's and the neighbor's uh, concerns and comments very seriously. Um, after the December hearing, the owner worked with her architect to make changes that respond to the concerns that we heard. We pulled uh, the enlargement back in the front, the rear, and the side. These changes further minimize visibility from the public way and make for a, a, a better project as we head to the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Um, also, these changes strengthen the case for the special permit under Section 74711. Uh, there will be no more than minimal impacts on nearby structures and open space and on the light and air of nearby uh, residential uses. Our building will continue to be among the lower buildings at this end of the block. At six stories, we're at the same height uh, as the uh, house to the, north, uh, to the west, and we're lower than the 20-story building to the west. Um, and uh, as for the impact on light and air, uh, our enlargement uh, has been set back, minimizing the impact, and we're uh, more than 32 feet from the nearest residential window to the west. Um, and thanks to you, we have a stronger project as we go to the Landmarks Commission. Uh, as as uh, Jeannie uh, indicated, uh, this building, the gallery, once open, will be open and free to the public. It should be an asset to the community. Both the exterior and the inter interior will have been beautifully restored. You'll hear about that in a few minutes. And I just want to thank uh, everyone uh, for your uh, thoughtful uh, input. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah? Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Scher. I'm from Higgins Quays Barth and Partners. We're the historic preservation consultants on the 3 East 89th Street project. Um, and I just wanted to talk a bit about the restoration um, and the cyclical maintenance plan that's part of the 74711 process. So the, the key component of the 74711 special permit um, is a comprehensive restoration and an adoption of a cyclical maintenance plan, uh, which the owner must submit to the Landmarks Commission for approval. With this project, the proposed restoration plan was particularly extensive and was unanimously approved by the CBA Landmarks Committee. This includes all necessary repairs to the granite, limestone, and brick facade, uh, the recreation of missing ironwork, and the repair of the copper mansard, reopening windows that have been infilled um, over time, and bringing back the monumental port cochere entrance. Uh, the ongoing cyclical maintenance plan uh, in connection with the 74711 is above and beyond what one might consider a standard restoration project. Um, the owner of 3 East 89th Street will be required to regularly survey the condition of the building and make all necessary repairs. This applies to not only the current owner, but all future owners of the property. I just want to underscore that, that this restoration work is extensive um, and will really bring back the uh, former luster of the building and the, the community can look forward to a first class quality building in perpetuity. Thank you. Thank you. Jim? There you are. I'm Jim Herr from Raphael Vanilli Architects. Uh, we're the architects for 3 East 89th Street. And uh, in like Jeannie and, and Stuart and Sarah, we wanted to thank the uh, Landmarks Committee, uh, the Community Board, for giving us your input. Um, it was very important to us, and we took your, all your comments uh, very seriously over the past two months in uh, revising our design and, and reducing it in scale. 
I uh, also wanted to thank the um, Carnegie Hill neighbors um, for all your input and meeting with us and, and going over your concerns in a very thoughtful and, and considerate manner. Um, a few summary uh, items. We've, um, since December, we've reduced the uh, uh, square footage of the, of the proposed addition by 1,800 square foot, which is about a 23% reduction in area. Um, and we did that by squeezing uh, the program. And we reduced the volume by 17,000 cubic feet, which is the height and the width of the building. Um, we have changed and uh, reduced the amount of glass that was in the uh, original proposal by, um, uh, by about 35%. Um, we've actually reduced the sixth floor addition. 80% uh, of the glass is now masonry, um, a masonry addition. Um, we have um, reduced uh, the front setback of the sixth uh, store floor addition, 35 feet from the facade, um, pushed it back five more feet. And we have um, eliminated the sixth floor uh, rear yard um, addition entirely. Um, we have also, um, in, based on discussions with our neighbors, um, we have um, reduced the uh, uh, rear yard extension in area um, by another um, 14,000 cubic, cubic feet. Um, and thank you for your uh, patience. Thank you. I always appreciate working with the community on behalf of the community board and, and having our input matter. Um, Christiana Pena, Kevin Hackett, and Lo Vandervalk. Good evening, my name is Christiana Pena. I'm here uh, with Ghetto and Demille on behalf of 3 East 89th Street. Uh, we'll be submitting tonight for the record a packet of letters that uh, express support for the proposal for 3 East 89th Street. And I'd just like to share an overview of who those institutions and individuals are. The Guggenheim Museum, in a letter from Richard Armstrong, director. In our field, Jeannie is esteemed for her singular curatorial sensibility, advocacy, and artistic leadership. Her team's respect for the architectural vernacular of this neighborhood is demonstrated in the preservation plan. I'm delighted to offer the Guggenheim support. From the neighboring Church of the Heavenly Rest, in a letter from Reverend Matthew Hyde, rector, we are satisfied that while some additional shadows may be cast by the proposed additions at 3 East 89th Street, these are minimal in size and experienced only for a short window of time. The proposal will not have an adverse impact on Church of the Heavenly Rest. We are delighted to offer our support. From the Noya Gallery, in a letter from Renee Price, director, the new Salon 94 Gallery will be an architectural experience as much as an artistic one. From the Jewish Museum, in a letter from Claudia Gould, director, a commercial gallery at this location will permit visitors to connect with contemporary art in an intimate way at no cost. From the nonprofit Performa, this location will provide the public with, with meaningful accessibility to contemporary art and ideas in optimal circumstances, at no cost, an extraordinary benefit for all. Additionally, we are pleased to have the support of fellow Upper East Side Galleries, David Zwerner Gallery and Petzl Gallery, and Upper East Side residents and neighbors, Susie and Bruce Kovner. And lastly, we did have the opportunity recently to present our plan to another neighbor on 89th Street, the Park Avenue Synagogue. Uh, and they do not oppose the project. We ask you tonight to please support this application. Thank you. I, I want to clarify before we move ahead with other speakers uh, on 3 East 89th Street that there are two elements to the proposal. One is to come before the land use on zoning variances, and the other one is the landmarks issue that we'll be hearing and, um, and voting on this evening. Right? <laughs> The zoning, the land use, we'll hear it after the Landmarks Preservation Commission approves. It has to do with uh, changes after. Tonight is only on the landmarks element. Okay, Kevin Hackett and Lowe. And we might as well get Michael Weinseer up here as well. If you guys, if people I call can line up, it'll save a few seconds. We have a lot of public speakers this evening, so that would be a help. Lo, do you want to go? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Lo Vandervalk. I'm president of Carnegie Hill Neighbors. Uh, we have we have uh, studied these uh, these uh, these drawings and these plans carefully. I want to say from the outset 
that we recognize the cultural value of Gallery 94 coming to 89th Street. Well, wait, hang on a second. What, what, what is that? The voice? Is it a speakerphone or something? If you could, whatever it is, I can't hear low, and I'm sure I, I'm not speaking only for myself. Thank you. All right. Um, well, there, there have been mentioned many adjustments, but we, we want to emphasize that there is still a huge increase from what was there before, and they need, they need variances for height for, for, uh, and for rear setbacks, and uh, they are adding, in the end, still 40% of square footage has been added. Uh, what we want to say is that your committee has done a thorough job of, of reviewing this project, and has come to the conclusion that they do not want to approve it. And I think, and I, we, uh, we applaud the thoroughness and we applaud their, their, um, their, uh, their conclusions. And I also want to say that we feel bad about the filling in of the rear yard because that's a special place uh, that allows uh, window views from another building that was once a part of this building and that now will be blocked. And, and you can take, that, that is taken into account when you're doing a 74, 711. Uh, obviously we have to bring that out now because uh, Landmark's decisions are important in moving this forward. So thank you very much and we applaud the work of your committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Hackett and I'm the president of the co-op board at 17 East 89th Street. Uh, fully nine of our shareholders are here uh, in support of the comments that I will make. Uh, Emily Andrin, Carolyn Thomas, Peggy Crow, Elise McVeigh, Bill Lorenzo, Justin Elliott, Ann Soren, Carl Soren, and Stephen Lasher. <coughs> I, if, if the committee would um, grant me this indulgence, I would like to, to read into the record uh, the text of my letter uh, before the recent Landmarks Committee meeting, which resulted in a resounding rejection of the second component of this project, which I will describe in my letter. I testified before your committee on December 16 in opposition to the 3 East 89th Street project and submit this letter to you as further written testimony in opposition. The project has two components, the art gallery component being the conversion of the existing structure to a private for-profit art gallery and ancillary uses including a first floor accessory cafe and the residential component being the expansion of the existing structure to approximately 145% of its current bulk to include a new multi-story private residence and ancillary improvements. With respect to the art gallery component, subject to being satisfied as to the parameters of the accessory cafe, we have no objection to the art gallery component. In fact, if the art gallery component represented the whole project and the residential component were not built, we would, subject to, to as Afra said, wholeheartedly welcome the art gallery component as a wonderful addition to our neighborhood. With respect to the second component, the residential component, both the scaffold mock-up mock, mock currently erected on the building and the applicant's written submission to this committee demonstrate that the residential component would be highly visible from both 89th Street and Fifth Avenue. The residential component, looming elephantine as it does so prominently over the neighborhood, violates the requirement a 7411 project have no more than a minimal impact. And finally, as importantly, permitting the residential component to proceed as proposed would result in a tremendous windfall and outright gift to the applicant in the form of free FAR, thus constituting an unwarranted public subsidy of a private enterprise. It would be a massive wealth transfer with no compensating public benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could I just have a, a picture that I'd like to have distributed to the to the board, if possible? Because I'm going to speak to it. Would that be okay? Um, yeah, but you have to start now. I, I will. I will start now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Michael Weinseer. I'm an owner and a member of the board of directors at 1085th Avenue, where my family and I have lived for over 25 years. 1085th is the building right next to and just to the west of 389th, where the pending project uh, is under discussion. Along with our neighbors at 17 East 89th, we similarly view the pro a proposed project as having two parts, the art gallery and the proposed expansion. We welcome the gallery uh, as an addition to the neighborhood. We want to see it succeed. However, until we uh, receive some information concerning the proposed operations of the cafe, 1080 has to reserve its right to object in the future uh, to including any type of a restaurant in the gallery. 
Even more so, uh, our concern lies in the second part of the project, which is the significant uh, expansion to the rooftop and the rear yard of the building. Uh, I provided you with, I believe, two pictures. Yeah, they, you, you should get them out while I'm speaking. I can, I'll speak to it and, and, and you'll, you'll take a look at it. The first picture is taken from 1085th, and as you can see, it's going to clearly show of what is effectively a two-floor addition to the existing four-story building. As the first photo will show, the purported infill to the existing fifth floor, as it's been characterized by the owner of 3 East 89th, is misleading, and in fact, two brand new floors are being added to the building. Based on the measurements provided by the owner in her current presentation, these two floors represent an addition of more than 22 feet of height on top of the existing 66 foot tall building. That's a 33% increase or one third increase in the existing height of the building. And that's before even taking into account the two large bulkheads that are proposed to be added on top of those two new floors. Furthermore, based on the owner's own figures in their proposal, the rooftop expansion alone would add more than 40,000 cubic feet of volume to the top of the building, which will give you some perspective. This is large enough to fit almost 11 New York City MTA buses into that space. Again, the owner proposes to, you, to, to add this massive addition on top of a small existing building just to create an unnecessary private residence on top of the art gallery. Thank you. We have a lot of speakers. Can Thank read, you. Can I read one sentence conclusion? One sentence. Okay. The unnecessary massive addition to these two new floors, equivalent in volume to 11 MTA buses on top of an existing small building, will be readily visible and significantly and adversely impact the surrounding structures and open space in the vicinity of 3 East 89th. So accordingly, we at 3 1080, at 1085th continue to strongly oppose the proposed rooftop and rear yard expansions for 3 East 89th Street. Thank you. Thanks a little bit of a run on, but it was okay. <laughs> okay, Elise McVeigh, Peggy, Crow, I think, or Cron, and um, Carol De Bull, De Boer. I, I massacred anyway, and when I can't read your handwriting, it's even worse. So thank you for uh, accommodating me. Okay. Good evening. My name is Elise McVeigh, and I'm a board member at 17 East 89th Street. I'm reading on behalf of a fellow shareholder, Claire Marks, uh, who submitted this same uh, statement to the local um, landmarks hearings. My name is Claire Marks and my husband and I have been residents at 17 East 89th Street for 28 years. I echo the sentiment of my board president that subject to being satisfied as to the, nature's, the nature of the gallery's accessory cafe, we are enthusiastic about Salon 94's restoration of the original structure at 3 East 89th Street and wholeheartedly welcome the addition of an art gallery to our block. However, I reiterate our opposition to the proposed expansion of the original structure on the following grounds. Per the pictures before you, and I'm sorry, we'll hand them out shortly. They're being handed out. Um, uh, per the pictures before you, the proposed addition would be not only visible from 89th Street, but from the eastern sidewalk of the Bridal Path where it impacts the sight line th through to the Guggenheim Museum and to the original structure of 3 East 89th Street. Most disturbingly, the glass front proposed for this structure would be totally out of keeping with the rest of our historic block and would certainly call attention to itself. The glass build out proposed at the rear of 3 East 89th Street is highly visible from both sides of Fifth Avenue. In front of the Church of the Heavenly Rest, the 90th Street uh, entrance to Central Park and the reservoir running track. Again, the proposed structure, which would only be be seen by so many is, keep, is out of keeping with the two landmark buildings on either side of it and with the neighborhood. Finally, the proposal's list of previous enlargements in the sport of the arts is misleading. All enlargements after 1941 were made by the National Art Gallery of Design, the National Academy of Arts, or the National Academy of School Institutions, which benefited the public. Not only is Salon 94 itself a private enterprise, but the lion's share of the proposed expansion is for private residents. It is not in the community's interest that the desires of one private party compromise the light, air, views, and character of the entire neighborhood. Thank you. Peggy? Yes, my name is Peggy Crow. Uh, I'm also a board member at 17 East 89th Street, a resident for about 33 years. 
I'd like to thank the committee's work um, and accurate reflection at the previous meeting of our building's views on this project. I'd like to reiterate um, Kevin Hackett's uh, testimony to you and again uh, just reiterate that we are strongly supportive of an art gallery in our neighborhood um, but see really no um, added value of this residential structure which I think would be unsightly and uh, certainly not a, a benefit to our building or others in the community. Thank you for uh, letting me speak. Thank you. Public is always welcome to come and speak. Carol? Good evening, my name is Carl De Boer. I'm the secretary of 14 East 90th Street. 14 East 90th Street is one of the three cooperative buildings on the same block as 3 East 89th Street. And the board of directors and shareholders of 14 East 90th have asked me to convey to all of you uh, their strong support of uh, 1080 Fifth Avenue and 17 East 89th Street in their opposition to the expansion of 3 East 89th Street. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Kevin Hackett. May I just ask, in his time remaining, that, we, that uh, the committee, uh, the board, I'm sorry, accept uh, the submission of the written testimony that uh, Michael Weisinger and Elise McVeigh and I made? May it, will, it will go to the office and be kept there. Sh should I give it to the office? Or? You, you can do that. This That's great. Our, thank you. Thank you. Office representative thank you very right much. Here, our district manager. Thank you. Stephanie Reckler, Elizabeth Rose Daly, and Jordan Wook. I'm Stephanie Reckler. I represent the Committee to Protect the Lenox Hill Neighborhood. We're a community-based nonprofit coalition of buildings and individuals who are opposed to Northwell Health's uh, plans to build the equivalent of a 50-story building on Lexington Avenue and the equivalent of a 40-story building on Park Avenue, all in the footprint of Lenox, of the current Lenox Hill Hospital. Needless to say, um, the impact on the neighborhood will be very significant. Um, we are collecting uh, petitions. We already have 6,000 petitions from neighbors who oppose uh, Northwell's plans. Um, I have, uh, for distribution, um, slides uh, on the impact of uh, the proposal. The, uh, um, these slides have been done by George Jaynes, a noted city planner and zoning expert. We have information. We're working with um, Fred Hyde, who's an authority on health care. Uh, and we're, we have um, great legal counsel um, to support us. Uh, if you haven't already signed a petition, we would really like your support. Um, and I have petitions and slides um, out front if, if you want to take them. Um, our website is www.savelenoxhill.org. I would like you to get on that website, become more familiar with us, and uh, support, support us. I thank uh, CB8 the Zoning Committee and, and the full board for their support. Um, we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Liz? Hi. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Rose Daly. I'm the Community Relations Manager of the Frick Collection and I just want to let you know that in the back on the table outside, I have put our new program brochure. Um, we currently have an exhibition of porcelain from the collection of Henry Arnhold. Um, it's porcelain from Meisen, um, and it's an absolutely wonderful exhibit that is arranged in the same style as the old um, porcelain rooms that you would have seen in the grand houses and palaces of the 17th and 18th century in Europe, so I urge you to come see that. I also want to remind you that um, on Friday, February 7th, we will have our next First Friday, which means that from 6 until 9 o'clock, it is free of charge to enter the museum. So you can wander around the galleries, and we will also have um, ongoing talks during the evening. 
And also, too, just a quick reminder that every Wednesday from 2 to 6 p.m., we have Pay What You Wish Wednesdays. And uh, I'll be sitting over here if you have any other questions. So thank you. Thank you. My name is Jordan Woke, and now for something completely different. I wanted to do a little bit of learning about what the community board has been doing. And with significant help from Will, I got to one of the streaming, the videos. It's really done very well. I suspect I'll get a, yeah, here's right there where I am. Um, and the cameras do cover the people. So if you need to listen to watch anything, I would urge you to take the time to learn how to get there because it is very well done. Wow, we love support, thank you. <laughs> How we get there, yeah, we'll 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 just say how we get there. Oh, okay. So this the the WDP live streaming is actually um, on uh, from support from our council members. Uh, our council members allocate money in the city budget every year for this exact purpose. So we want to thank our council members for that support and ask that they'll continue the support going forward in the next fiscal year as the budget just the first budget part of the budget just came out. And the council will be doing their part of the budget coming up. So we just want to keep that on their minds and that they'll continue to support us in the way that uh, is very helpful for our oh, community. I could have done that. I thought you were going to talk about how to find it online. Oh, find it on the, uh, on the <laughs> meeting uh, page for each uh, full board meeting. So you can go to meeting agendas and find each of the different uh, full board meetings. If you go to full board on the website, cb8m.com, and uh, you can click through to find the individual meeting you want to go back to. Look on that and watch the video right on our website. Thank you, and thank you, council members. Okay, Andrew, I am not even gonna try. You know who you are um, and how I massacre your name. And Wendy McC McC McCaver, McCaver. Wendy, are you here? Okay. That's such a shame, because I, 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 no, I always like that. hearing how you try to pronounce oh, okay. it. It In keeps that case, it fresh. Ravistiere. Okay, very good. Hi, my name is Andrew Ravish here. There it's you go. nice to uh, see many familiar faces, and it may be a new year, but it's the same me and the same message. We need a 210 foot uh, height cap on new developments in this city. A little background around me, or about me uh, I'm a cellular researcher by training. I've been published twice in peer reviewed uh, publications. And my specific focus and my research is on how changing environments and urbanization uh, affects our cellu cellular protein stress responses. And so environmental causes are near and dear to my heart. Um, when we think of tall buildings over development, we tend to think of the aesthetics or mom and pop shops. But really, it's important to consider the environmental ramifications of uh, buildings over 210 feet. Uh, with a cluster of them, we have urban heat islands, which means that it's hotter on the ground. We actually undergo thermal stress, and our proteins begin to denature or unravel. We tend to think of uh, climate change as a very macro issue, but really it's quite invasive. Uh, we also have a reduction of wind, which, although that really sounds nice on a cold winter day, wind actually plays a really important role in urban ecosystems, where it sweeps out uh, particulate matter that just occurs in a very busy, thriving city. And I'm happy to see that energy and carbon emissions are being considered uh, in new development. There was a New York uh, Post article that says that uh, going forward, if new developments don't meet certain environmental standards, they're going to be fined a million dollars. But that's in insufficient because one, one million dollars in fines is not really a detergent or, or a deterrent rather for these billion dollar real estate companies. And two, the actual distance between the top of a building and the ground, the height, uh, greatly impacts the environmental harm new developments bring about. So again, I know many of you have heard this message before. I'm urging for a 210 foot height cap in new developments. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy? Hi, I'm Wendy McIver. I live uh, on 81st and 1st and I am here again to uh, wish everybody a happy new year and I'm, I thank you for this opportunity for the first meeting of CB8 uh, of the year. And for anybody who hasn't heard me say this for the last year and a half, I am here also to support a 210 cap because of the uh, very uh, immediate effects uh, on climate change pollution caused by buildings over 20, 21 floors. I even brought one of the studies with me to show the graphs that, uh, that have, these have been measured across the world, but especially in Asia. And we're only be 
beginning to see the impact here now. And I know that there are so many people in this room who are going to be seeking office, either local or state, and it's a very exciting time and an exciting year. And I hope that you will hear our message as to what, what is uh, fact-based and data-driven uh, on the part of uh, sustaining our very fragile island and all of the islands and the one peninsula of New York City, as well as having an impact uh, on the rest of the United States. And um, I also think that it will be a fairer uh, situation for developers who should not be perceived of as the enemy. They are pushing forth with the ways that they want to push forth in business that is good for business. And if they have clear guidelines, they will be able to plan accordingly. If it's always a chasing game without proper regulations, with, um, with what the city council passed in terms of trying to limit the uh, pollution effects of buildings, that was a wonderful initiative. It does not change the impact of above 21 floors in a dramatic and exponential fashion. So we hope that everybody in the room is hearing this and will either take it to the representatives or be the representatives and will uh, also partner with developers to uh, make their uh, business sustainability secure in what is also sustainable for us. Thank you. Okay. Before, before, Elizabeth? I want to tell the last two speakers that the community board has a proposal before the city planning commission, which in, uh, for special districts on our only, we only have four unprotected avenues. Everybody else has a height limit of either 210 or less. Uh, but we have a proposal before the city planning commission that uh, among other things, limits the height of new buildings on 1st, 2nd, 3rd New York to 210 feet. So appreciate that. Thank you very much. And, and to protect the tenement and small business yes, at the same time. Small These speakers were talking about the 210 and we're for it and we're proposing to do it. Before we move towards adoption of the agenda and um, any changes to the minutes we have a special guest our former chair jim kleins who is now a sitting as you will soon see he's a sitting judge and he's come to do a very special service gail if you would join us please yes and also trisha come on up and the two rebecca's and billy come on over Still Jim, also known as Jimmy. <laughs> All right, so we'll begin with I and state your name. I, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of New York. The Constitution of the State of New York. The City Charter of the City of New York. The City Charter of the City of New York. And the bylaws of the Manhattan Community Board 8. And the bylaws of the Manhattan Community Board 8. And that I will faithfully discharge. And that I will faithfully discharge. The duties as an officer of Manhattan Community Board 8. The duties as an officer of Manhattan Community Board 8. According to the best of my ability, so help me God. According to the best of my ability, so help me God. Congratulations. Congratulations to the 2020 Community Board Officers. Thank you so much for giving us your evening. Okay. All right, thank you everyone for your patience. It's always exciting to have a real judge and to be taken very seriously here. So good, okay. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? Second? Any opposed? All in favor? Aye. Great, the agenda is adopted. Is, are there any amendments to the minutes? 
Okay, then the minutes are adopted. Okay, we're turning now to the reports of the elected officials. Do we have, um, Isabel, are you here from uh, the borough president's office? Great, come on up first and then everyone else could get online. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, first full board of the year. And um, there are not many announcements from the Manhattan Board President's Office. Um, just a reminder that um, our diaper drive is still going on until the 31st of the month. And again, um, preferred sizes are four and five. Uh, but you could actually drop whatever you can. Uh, we are collecting at our downtown office. And um, I would also be happy to pick up if that's easier for you. Let me know, because uh, I'm constantly coming in and out of both uh, Upper East Side and East Harlem for meetings. So that's not a problem. Um, so you all remember that last December we had that unfortunate uh, incident, that tragedy that occurred in uh, Morningside Park. And that sparked a lot of responses. And we had um, constituents coming to present at our board about public safety and feeling that um, something is not right. And um, as a result of what happened, as a response, uh, we are organizing this um, Morningside Park Community Forum, but in reality, it's not just uh, limited to Morningside, uh, the, the, that area, that neighborhood. Uh, we really encourage everybody to come and participate because the um, issues that we are facing, and especially this violence involving these very young people um, in our communities, is, is something that it belongs to all of us and that we should all care about. And so uh, this Morningside Park Community Forum is happening January 29th at 6.30, and it's going to be at the Police Athletic League at 441 Manhattan Avenue. This is between um, 109, at the 119th Street uh, entrance. So there will be many stakeholders from that area, uh, but any representation from other neighborhoods is really appreciated because this is a conversation that we need to be having citywide. Um, the other event that is happening is the celebration of Black History Month in honor of the 100th anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance. And so this is an invitation to um, join us on Wednesday, February 12th from 6 to 9 at The Mist in Harlem, 46 West 116th Street. And this shall be fun. Uh, we encourage people to um, bring a quote, a line, or a short poem from a black author and share it uh, with the public. Um, I recently shared uh, this letter that the uh, borough president sent to um, Governor Cuomo. And this is in uh, reference to the congestion pricing, which is very problematic. Um, especially for many who already are paying more, uh, who live uh, below 96th Street, and how this congestion pricing, uh, when it goes into effect, is going to even uh, drive uh, prices higher. And of course, for many of us, this is uh, problematic. And um, last week, I attended uh, the East 86th Street Block Association uh, Community Forum, and this was one of the big topics. And um, I know there's talk about a task force, but uh, President Brewer wants you to know that she's uh, having the conversation um, about the congestion pricing and the impact that it will have, and also having representation from the people that are going to be impacted. So I brought a few copies of this letter, which I also share with some of you already. And um, please keep sending your feedback and your um, suggestions. This is a conversation that's going to be happening, uh, and uh, at some point there shall be a meeting with uh, the borough president to see how we can work creative ways to um, not have people, some people in some areas, uh, take the, the load, the financial load. Um, the last two announcements shall be very short, and it's just a reminder that we continue having the conversations with the Lenox Hill um, 
about the Lenox Hill Hospital expansion as it has been proposed. And um, you have great representation. Uh, the next task force meeting is going to be February 4th, uh, our downtown office. And again, we continue having the conversations and hoping that Northwell um, it's going to listen to the requests of the community. It's going to make adjustments to the plan according to the desires and the interests of the community. Uh, and the last announcement has to do with the Religious Facilities Task Force. This has been an amazing experience, very um, educational, and many religious facilities still uh, keep uh, reaching out to our office, asking um, about how they can join, even though we have one more uh, meeting which is going to be February 21st at our downtown office also, uh, 1 Central Street. This one um, has to do more with the product. After having these conversations about the real estate challenges that the uh, religious communities are facing, um, and now uh, a product is going to come out of all these meetings and presentations, and that's going to be for public consumption. Whenever it's ready, we'll make sure it gets out to the communities. Um, I have no more. Any questions? Sarah? Hey, I have a question about the Morningside Rise event. Will NYPD be attending that event? Yes, NYPD and also um, school leadership um, because we have been, so this, this issue is not simple and um, something, it's so many things. So today, for instance, I uh, went to explore a uh, building in uh, East Harlem because for I'll say for the last six months we have been working very diligently, diligently trying to identify a place where we can provide additional programming but also programming that extends to uh, late in, into the day we're talking about maybe offering programming like like the door in, on Broom Street um, they have late programming they offer meals and so President Brewer has been exploring ways of uh, gathering uh, foundation um, money, uh, funding that can be directed into these communities where uh, there is an accumulation. There's a saturation of, of many things, uh, both good and bad, but many things are apparently are not working. So I went today with the DA's office and um, some uh, personnel from the Silverman School of Public Health to explore a, a location we want some uh, a place in East Harlem that is not close to any of the NYCHA developments because we do have a big issue with uh, uh, crews or, or gang activity at, at each development. And so it's very territorial. And it's difficult to have a place where you can have youth come without feeling um, in the, endangered. Uh, and so we're gonna have NYPD, we're gonna have school authority, we're gonna have um, many stakeholders from the community, and you're welcome to come. their interrogation of minors without counsel and circulating photos of minors as they were developing suspects on NYPD social media. And so I, I would ask that that be raised as well because that goes, um, that's hand in hand with community trust and no one wants the another Central Park crime to reoccur. And that's a great point and um, I think if you cannot attend, I think that's a really great question to send to our team to be presented um, because it represents uh, a perspective from the community. So I would really appreciate if you could email that. I, I can give you April Adams is the um, uh, liaison from CB9 who is um, organizing this event. So that, that's a great question. Thank you. Barbara. we've talked about it. What's getting me more and more upset as I walk through the streets are more and more buildings are being raised and they stay that way for years and years and years and years. So not only do we get rid of the affordable housing that's there for years, even when the building eventually comes up if they have a few apartments that are affordable housing, it's been years that people have been displaced. The small businesses have been closed and displaced. But the streets are not taken care of. I know these legally, it's, it, you don't have to tell them to keep lights on, but it's so dangerous. I wish we would change the legal to be that people that live in the neighborhood, walk through the streets, have lights, 
that the, the sidewalks are taken care of. If you look at the property where Bustides was on 86 between 1st and 2nd, the street is totally broken up. When there was ice there, it, I, I'm sure that they, even if they shoveled the snow, that would have been ice there, and it's pitch black. It is dangerous. We're getting rid of affordable housing. I'm talking about five, six, seven years that these buildings are kept empty. And I'm wondering if there's some thought about maybe as this wonderful job that we did in terms of fighting for uh, lower heights, we could also fight for the fact that we don't raise buildings until there's some sort of plans or that you have to take care of it or something else like that that will help the community. That's another uh, important. Very good question. But exactly. And so what I think is, um, I actually uh, gave some feedback from East Harlem where um, also small businesses and uh, we, have, uh, we have been meeting with other businesses that fear that what's happening to Fairway is gonna happen to them because there are many uh, uh, regulations and policies that are so outdated. And uh, so I think that um, it would be great if you could put that on an email because uh, so what, what some people from East Harlem were saying, you go to any other city and it's so different from New York. In New York, the small businesses actually give New York a sense of identity and we're losing that. And um, so people have been talking about maybe some ideas having to do with like the uh, rent tax that... Uh, they just put up this horrible blue, you know, plywood barriers that are so ugly. And it's years. It isn't a temporary thing. When something is multiple, multiple years, it's not, I don't consider it temporary at all. So it's so ugly. And, and it, I, there's nothing positive about well, what they're doing. I really appreciate it and it's a significant issue. Uh, but would you, because we need to move along, would yes. you send an email to... Isabel, and she'll put you in touch with anyone else from the borough president's land use. And of course, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Oh, and then one last thing, please, with the census. Um, Aldrin Bonilla, our deputy borough president, wants you to know that if you are interested as an organization to partner up to make sure that everybody gets counted, please contact him. We have lots of materials and information. Um, and uh, it's very important that people get counted because uh, a lot is at stake. So um, again, I have cards and uh, can give them to you. I'll stay till the end of the meeting. You can see me at the end and um, can answer any more questions and give you more information about census and any other staff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Jack. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Jack. I'm from Assemblymember Seawright's office. Um, I just have a couple of announcements. Assemblymember always wants me to let everyone here know that she does support a 210 foot limit on the avenues and will continue to support that height limit. Uh, yeah. Um, also, just in light, it feels that, uh, well, in light of recent fires in the neighborhood and it feels like it's been an increasing amount, we are working to um, do a partnership with American Red Cross to get some smoke detectors installed in anyone's apartment. It's gonna be free of charge and all uh, done through the American Red Cross. So if you are in need of smoke detectors in your home, reach out to our office. We'll have more details coming soon, but in coming weeks, we're gonna be doing that. Um, our office is also holding a book drive with Project Circio. Um, if you have any books and would like to drop them off at our office, that'd be great. It's for children in uh, grades K through 12. Um, and then also, uh, the assembly members is real busy in Albany. There's gonna the budget hearings are announced, and there's a lot of them coming in the coming weeks. Um, just so you all know, all the New York State budget hearings are broadcasted um, live and archived through the New York State Assembly website, and also I believe the New York State Senate website. So if you're ever looking for additional information on that, there are great resources there for you to stay in touch with what is happening um, this legislative session but that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions for me? Not usually, but I will take them. <laughs> but yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you, Jack. Hi, Jenna. All right, hi everyone. I'm Jenna Klaus from Council Member Keith Powers' office. I just wanted to share some highlights from 2019. 
Um, we did participatory budgeting for the first time in the district last year with nearly 3,000 people voting on projects to improve the district, and we got new tech upgrades for schools and libraries, new bathrooms at Wagner Middle School, tree plantings, tree guards throughout the entire district. So thank you for participating last year. We're gonna do it again this year. Um, and also last year, Councilmember Powers introduced 17 new bills and authored six new laws. Um, some of these new laws were for tenant protections against unlawful evictions, creating more humane conditions for animals, improving conditions in the city's criminal justice system. And he also introduced legislation to reduce costs on small businesses in our district to improve our city's elections and reduce upfront costs for renting an apartment and much more. Um, more recently, um, based on a lot of complaints coming from particularly close to Central Park on the Upper East Side um, is the issue of excessive amount of helicopter flights, the noise, um, the safety implications that it has. Um, so in response to this, Council Member Powers authored a letter to the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, with many of his city and state colleagues asking that the agency impose special flight rules and restrictions for helicopters, non-essential flights flying over all of New York City. Um, so we'll keep you updated on the response we get from that. Um, also new to announce is we, or Councilmember Powers has funded cleanup around the 72nd Street subway station. So, <laughs> thank you, Valerie. Um, so Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, a cleanup crew will be on site, and we look forward to feedback on how that improves. And then just a couple more things. Isabel gave the Lenox Hill update, so I don't have to do that. Um, and two upcoming events, we're having a bike safety training next week on the 29th at the Yorkville Library for young and adult cyclists to learn the rules of the road. And then I would like you all to save the date, February 26th. We're having a big event on ULERP, an educational forum with the Municipal Arts Society. It will be held at Wagner Middle School. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Audrey, it's been ages. Hi. Hi, I'm Audrey Tannen from State Senator Liz Kruger's office. I'm pinch hitting from Mike. Uh, this semester, so I'm glad to see you all again. A few things, number one, um, I just wanna respond to the Transportation Committee's or Alita's letter. Please know that Liz has been in direct conversations with Patrick Foy, with Andy Byford, and I know she has a verbal commitment from uh, Patrick Foy to have some meetings, some public meetings in the district. So of course I will share this with her. Um, she'll continue to be your representative and uh, have these conversations and make sure we get some of these meetings here in the, in the city. Um, so thank you for sharing this with us and be sure she'll see it. Number two, I wanna confirm what Jack says. You can definitely watch those Senate Finance Committee um, hearings online at the Senate website. Know that Liz continues to be the chair of the Finance Committee, so she is obviously in Albany and obviously entrenched with these budget hearings, and that's gonna be going on for the entire month or so. Also know that as she did last year, she and her Senate colleagues will be hosting here in Manhattan, save the date, February 29th, which is a Sunday from two to five at the New York Academy of Medicine, some budget hearings here, right in town on Sunday, February 9th. We've got some flyers out there. Um, so please join us for that. The other event coming up, February 7th, along with Senator Serrano's office, we're having another scam forum because uh, there's such a need, it's just such a prevalent issue. So that's February 7th from two to four at the Stanley Isaacs houses. That's it, happy new year, nice to see you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. And the Academy of, of Medicine, is that where it is on? Yes. On 5th and 103rd? Yeah. It's a beautiful building, so it's worth seeing for the building alone. Hi, Terrell. Terrell. Hi. Hello. Hi, uh, good evening, and Happy New, uh, happy, uh, new Year's, everyone. My name thank is you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Terrell Brock, and I'm a community liaison from uh, State Senator Jose Serrano's office, and I hope everyone is, do, is, uh, is doing well. 
And uh, I want to mention that during the, the month of January, the Senator's off-site constituent hours will be dedicated to health and wellness in the 29th District. We're, we're partnering with the uh, Neighborhood Action Health Centers, uh, New York Statewide uh, senior, senior Council, and Food Bank for NYC, which will be conducting SNAP screenings and re-verifications. Our next constituent hours is tomorrow, and will be uh, located um, in the Roosevelt Island Senior Center at five, uh, um, uh, 546 Main Street from uh, 11 a.m. to uh, 2 p.m. And we, we'll be joined by uh, uh, Food Bank for NYC and New York uh, Statewide Senior Action Council. Uh, feel free to stop by our OSA constituent hours to share any questions or concerns. Uh, we're here to assist. And for more information in regards to uh, upcoming constituent hours, please call our office at 212-828-5829 or you can also email me at uh, tbrock uh, at nysenate.gov. And also we mentioned that the uh, senator is working with the uh, MTA and REARC to facilitate additional meetings and conversations about the proposed changes to the Q102. And uh, he's, he's uh, well aware of the concerns that have been raised by community members and any uh, bus redesign plan that um, ne negatively impacts Roosevelt Island residents is one that he would uh, never support. And, uh, and, and uh, I would also like to read a quote from the, the senator, which is a view I share. Um, over the, the last several weeks, we have seen a series of despicable anti-Semitic attacks in New York, including the horrific uh, incident in Rockland County during Hanukkah. Uh, an attack on the Jewish community is an attack on all New Yorkers. And we must uh, come together to, to reaffirm that religious discrimination and bigotry have no place in our society. Uh, as we enter the, the new year, um, I will continue to work with my colleagues in the ma in majority conference to protect the human rights of every New Yorker and devise solutions to combat uh, hate and intolerance. Any uh, questions? All right. Uh, have a good evening, everybody. My name is Rebecca. I am from Assemblymember Danforth's office. As you are aware, session has begun in Albany. Assemblymember Court is looking forward to another productive year of passing progressive legislation such as ending solitary confinement and reforming our state's parole system. Before the holidays last year, Governor Cuomo signed two of the Assemblymember's bills into law. The first, which I have mentioned before here, is a bill that now allows insurance companies to synchronize a patient's prescriptions into being refilled at the same time so someone can pick up all of their prescriptions at once instead of making multiple trips to the pharmacy. The second bill is to improve access to health insurance coverage for substance abuse treatment, including medication-assisted treatment. This bill ensures that addicted persons with commercial insurance coverage can access medication-assisted treatment as prescribed by their health care providers without unnecessary barriers. Lastly, the governor stated in his budget address yesterday that he has included an increase to state education aid to $28.5 billion with a goal to create equity in school funding. While we approve of this increase, Assemblymember Court is still committed to fully fund the founda foundation aid formula. Back in 2006, the New York State Court of Appeals ruled in favor of the Campaign for Fiscal Equity, ruling that the state was ordered to give $5.5 billion to school districts in the state, 68% of those that are high need school, and the state still has not given any of the money. We are determined to make sure that the children in our schools get funds that they are owed through the CFE lawsuit. And yes, that concludes my report. Are there any questions? No, great, thank you. Have a good thank meeting. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. I'm Abby. I'm from Councilmember Ben Kalos's office. Just a few quick updates. Um, as of last month, the 67th Street Library is fully open again. Um, as you may know, the council member um, has been pushing for universal after school um, since 2013. So we had our hearing on that last week. And finally, we are having our annual State of the District this Sunday, the 26th, from 12.30 to 3 at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, the 12.30 to 1, we're going to have a volunteer fair, and the council member is going to start speaking at 1. Be sure to stay till the end for free bagels with Ben. Thanks so much. Thank you.
Before Mike Stinson from Control of Stringer's office gives his report, I'd like to give a report about Mike. He just had a baby. <laughs> Ooh, Chris, Christopher, obviously a little boy. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lita. And I just have two quick announcements. One is an event that will feed you. The second one is a, is a paid internship program. So two great things for the Upper East Side I know you love. So the first thing, next Tuesday night, uh, we're having our Lunar New Year event. It's going to be at the Stephen A. Schwartzman Building on 42nd Street. It's at 476 Fifth Avenue. Doors open at 5.30 p.m. We have some great honorees and some great performers. And like I said, there will be free food that is delicious. So please stop by next week. It will run till about 8 o'clock. And then our summer internship program, we are accepting applications as of now. It, the program term is nine weeks from June 8th to August 6th. The application period is open until March 6th. It's for undergrad, and undergrad, grad, and law students. We do pay. The undergrad interns will receive an hourly salary in the range of $15 to $16. And the grad and law students will receive an hourly wage from $19 to $22. They have opportunities to work in our community affairs unit, finance, budget, basically anything that the controller's office does, we have opportunities for internships. So we'd love to have any young talent that you feel would be interested, apply it. We do have flyers, it's on our website, so please send it to any young people you know. We'd love to have them. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations. Thank you, and as soon as he gets his shots, I'll bring him down here. Okay. <laughs> Hi, right, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, just want to make sure that I can, I'm just going to put that. Hi, right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, excited to be here. My name is Philip Ellison. I represent the New York City Public Advocate. I'm the Manhattan Borough Advocate, um, overseeing all of Manhattan engagement through the New York City Public Advocate's office. Um, somewhat of a homecoming. I'm from Manhattan and from the area. I grew up around uh, in the area. I went to Dewey Richmond for a little bit. Um, growing up, so it's, it's really a pleasure to be here, and uh, I've had a chance to meet um, your board chair at Manhattan Borough, Borough Meetings, and I do want to take a, a second to, um, from my, my perch uh, in those meetings, you have someone who's advocating on your behalf, fighting and trying to collaborate with other board chairs across Manhattan uh, to solve the problem, so uh, that's something that was notable. I want to take a, a moment to just kind of introduce our office and Jamani Williams uh, for folks who don't understand. I think it's important to make sure people who, who uh, who, who might not know the office, maybe not know who Jamani Williams is, to, to paint that picture so we can figure out how to be most helpful and useful to a community. Um, Jamani Williams is a born and raised New Yorker, uh, a Brooklyn Tech alum, or a Brooklyn College, and he really has been like an activist around housing and been a, city, a successful city councilman. And so now he recently won re-election as uh, the New York City Public Advocate, right? And the Public Advocate Office does a few things. We do, uh, as an office and through, um, you know, the Honorable Mr. Williams, work with his fellow former city council people, some of the folks who work for people in this room, and pass legislation. Uh, I think that's really important, that that is a power. He doesn't vote on it, but he introduces it and works with his colleagues that he still has a lot of relationships with to get done. And I think what's relevant, um, he recently, he's passed more the legislation than the last two public advocates, and we have a great attorney general who was the last public advocate, um, Letitia James, and we recently passed, um, Intro 56B, which is around uh, the abuse of placards, right? I know parking, um, free parking is a really big issue for certain families. And so essentially, we've made sure that folks that abuse placards, abuse free permit parking, um, that they're fine. We're working with the police in that regard to make sure our parking is not abused in that regard. Um, and so we also deal with uh, getting folks connected to resources. We have the constituency team, and he has a bully pulpit. He is known, the media wants to really hear from him, and he has a coalition of folks. So if you have an issue around housing, seniors, um, small or big, the Public Advocates Office is here. I'm excited to be here um, in this community moving forward and finding ways to work with your chair and the audience on solving issues. And I thank you for your time today. Thank you, and we're glad to work with you, so thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, we have questions. Valerie? I want to say thank you so much for coming because you're the one representative of a citywide official who's been here since I've been a member of this community board. The mayor has never sent a representative to this community board, so I just want to say on behalf of my uh, my 
organization, which is East 72nd Street Neighborhood Association. As a member of this community board, I really re respect the public advocate for sending you here. And then secondly, um, I would like to know, maybe come back to the next meeting, what, your, what his position is on congestion pricing and how that affects our community. And we would hope that the public advocate would work with us on issues related to, to uh, congestion pricing. And I, I do know, and I, I one, thank you for, for that comment. I think that is the intention of our office as someone who's been a community organizer and coalition builder that actually matters in communities. And, and so having us being engaged and being present and uh, our team will expand. I, we are, that's exactly the purpose. I will say Michael, I know who just had a baby, um, Scott Stringer and, uh, has, they've had a presence and I see Michael. Yeah, no, 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 it's not. No, I, I know he does a great job in representing and I'm, I'm glad to uh, have a colleague in government doing that kind of work around city. And lastly, I do think it's actually important just to explain our internal, how the office works. I'll be very brief on this. To your question, you have Damani Williams, the public advocate of New York City. You have two deputy public advocates, first deputy public advocates, one in community engagement and legislation who run those teams. And then we have five deputy public advocates in specific issue areas. People who are authorities, former engineers who are on the environment and infrastructure team, people that have worked on housing and ec in housing, equity and justice, uh, and then community organizers, um, really people that are really dynamic um, folks uh, from different backgrounds. And we really touch um, those issue areas around the community members and engage them and bringing them into the fold, as well as these organizations that work in these issues in the city, right? And so that just gives you a scope of how our office is structured to how you can best touch in and tap into what, what we're doing to amplify your voice, et cetera. I do think the other example around the bully pulpit, we released the uh, 100 worst landlords list. The public advocate went across the city with advocates. I have some folks who are in this room, and, uh, whether public and private housing, NYCHA housing, um, as well, and media was there. The next day, those tenant leaders were on TV all throughout the city and then getting fixes, right? And that's part of the power we think that the public advocate has, and so we're excited to be here, and I thank you for that comment. And on congestion pricing, I will go back to, a lot of folks are trying to figure out what does this look like? We all know what happened, you know, some people know what's going on in London with congestion pricing, so our um, infrastructure and transportation team, that's something I'm actually interested in talking with a little bit more about, and I can come back the next meeting. Cool. Lori? Hi. Um, uh, my name is Lori Gores, and I want to thank you for coming. And I also want to thank you for bringing up the issue of parking uh, tickets, of parking placards. Um, I'm on the Transportation Committee, and I believe it was last year, someone came to us and said that there was legislation being considered uh, to uh, put technology to work to um, uh, identify all of the um, <coughs> parking placards, you know, so that the, the police don't have to, you know, try to decipher which one. I mean, I have seen, it's unbelievable how creative people are, yeah. you know, and people make fake placards all the time, and the parking uh, authorities mm -hmm. don't know, like, whether to, you know. So my question is, what happened to that legislation? Is there anything that that is, I mean, this seems like a fairly easy problem to solve if you just put technology to work, but I don't know why it died. So yeah. do you have any idea? It's a great question. Personally, before this, I've, I've worked in education as well as a tech startup. I'm, I'm passionate, our office is working around different issues that technology is affecting our city, but there are ways that technology can be used for efficiency and impact, an example you're using. I don't specifically know about that. I'm, I'm, you sparked a curiosity. I'm gonna make a note and ask um, our transportation team, particularly what's going on with how do you scan Q codes and how do you leverage technology to decipher false placards and so forth. Um, but I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. you uh, oh, can you take my letter back yeah, to the yeah, Absolutely, and I've heard from you as well. <laughs> I always have a lot to say. Um, are there any other elected, oh, sorry, Sharon. Um, first of all, I just wanted to tell you, because you may not know, uh, several years ago, before Jumani Williams uh, became a council member, uh, he was invited to speak at a uh, housing town hall forum that was produced by Community Board Aid. And uh, so he already does have that uh, relationship with us. And also, we really appreciate his long-standing commitment to affordable housing. He was invited uh, to a Community Board Aid's uh, town hall forum mm -hmm. specifically to talk about uh, affordable housing issues. And uh, just 
Thank him. Thank you, first of all. I'd like to also add to uh, Valerie and, and, and Lori, who also appreciated the fact that you're here as well. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Happy. I'm an Manhattanite. This is our role, and this is, to your point, his longstanding whether he's been an activist, whether he's been an elected official, and now as a citywide public advocate, it's very consistent. So I appreciate acknowledging that. Um, and I'll, I'll be here most likely till the end. Uh, if there's anything I can be helpful with or just collaborate with or give you information on, I'm happy to do so. I will say, if you need to email me, I just want to put give it out there and I will be quiet, um, um, I promise. Uh, my email is P, as in Philip Ellison. Like Ralph Ellison, unfortunately, I'm not related. Um, uh, Ellison at, so that's E L L I S O N, at uh, advocate.nyc.gov. So please reach out um, and thank you and have a good night. We're glad to have you. Thank you. Are there any other representatives of elected officials who have not come up? Okay, well, thank you, everyone. I know we had a good large turnout tonight, so thank you. Okay, I will. Uh, try and be brief. So last time, I think it was, I had mentioned, or maybe the time before, that we wanted to give recognition to businesses, entities, individuals who really uh, go above and beyond and make an outstanding contribution to the community. So I'm thinking about a methodology to do that. We have forms. Are they online, Will? Uh, no, we just have a flyer. Okay, we have a flyer, it's out there. If you have nominations or suggestions, please email them. And I'm thinking of a rotating group of maybe four or five people month to month who will be able to pick from among the suggestions for that. And um, I, as I mentioned, I have an idea for the first one, but I'd really like input from members of the board, public members, regular members, and members of the public as well. Okay, um, we have a couple of new business items, so don't leave at the end. Um, for public members, I'd like to get a short email from you about what you have contributed to the committee and whether you would like to stay on as a public member. I'll discuss it with chairs before reappointing anyone. Public members are appointed for a year. Um, for the chairs of committees, I'd like a statement from you about whether you would like to continue as chair of your committee. Um, Okay, so um, there have been people sometimes who are injured or are sick and are not able to come to meetings. To respect their privacy, I'm very cognizant of that. I don't make um, an announcement unless I have their permission or uh, so submit a card, have you guys sign a card to send to them without their permission. So I wanted you to know that. But having said that, Sophia James was injured and I neglected to mention it, but I did want to point out that she, uh-oh, I took the wrong thing, that she, has made a significant achievement. She was selected to join the 2020 cohort of 4.0 Essential Fellows. The Essentials Fellowship takes aspiring founders from ideas in their heads to running small scope pop-up experiences in their communities. And her is, hers has to do with education and online um, advantages for people involved in education. So we're really proud of her. I think there's a big meeting in, in uh, New Orleans, which is always fun. Um, there will be a congestion pricing task force. Stay tuned for information about that. Of course, anyone will be um, welcome to join that if you are interested. And we're talking, or I'm thinking about the scope of it. I did uh, reach out to CB7, who shares our predicament at the edge of congestion pricing zone, to see if they want to work jointly on a task force. And we may have alternate meetings together or separately. They have some kind of issue that they need to resolve on their own first. I also am uh, talking to and working with Tricia and Lynn on getting more public art into the community. At the very least, public art is a distraction from all the horrible advertising we have on the link kiosks and the bus shelters. Um, Oh, it's so for if you are not reapplying, your term ends when the new members are appointed. So that could be April, May, or as happened a couple of years ago, June. So you need to come to the meetings until we have new members. If you don't want to continue to do that and you are not reapplying, then you need to resign. The borough president's office, though, discourages resignations because it leaves gaps in board membership and they like to have a fully committed board. And last, I'd like to mention that applications for membership on the community board, and of course I encourage any members of the public interested in joining the community board to apply, has been extended to February 14th, which is good because you need to love New York to be able to do this. Okay, Will? I don't know how to follow that. <laughs> uh, I'll be very brief, happy new year. Uh, 
I just wanted to give an update on something I spoke about, uh, I think two months ago, about Hunter College and uh, the space that we were able to use there. Uh, there was a policy change that, that the college had that they're gonna start charging us and elected officials uh, to use their space. Uh, someone anonymously gave Hunter College uh, a donation in our name uh, to do three events there this year. Um, so if they're watching, thank you. Uh, if they're here, double thank you. Um, so, and, and they said that they would talk to us when we use those up, so there may even be more. But we just wanted to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts to whoever that was. And then also maybe they could change the policy. Um, <laughs> back, back to the way we thought it was. Yeah. Yes. To, so uh, that's actually a great statement there. Um, the community board actually relies solely on uh, spaces like this that donate their space to the board, uh, our city agency, to do it for free. Uh, we're able to meet in the blood center for free. We're able to meet in Ramaz, and we're able to meet in a lot of uh, institutions in the Upper East Side for free every month. Uh, we have you know between 15 and 20 meetings some months. Uh, that we, we take those donations for free. It, it also means that we have to go every month, every, every year to all the nonprofit institutions in our district asking to, to come to use their space for free. Um, other uh, community boards are, have space of their own. They, they have a big enough space that they can host meetings. Um, but this is a predicament across the city. Um, and we're, we're only able to really use free space. So if A, if you know of any spaces in the community that are handicap accessible, that are open at night, uh, where we could meet. You know, let me know. Let uh, Alita know. Um, we're ha I'm happy to go meet with the principal, the whoever it is, uh, president of the institution. Um, we're always looking for new spaces. Uh, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with the spaces that we, we use every month. Um, so, a thank you to all the spaces that, that allow us to use their space. But also, if you know any other ones that will let us use their space for free, please let me know. Yes, sir. Uh, What's the basis or rationale for a, co a public <coughs> college that we fund to charge a public <laughs> entity for space? That is a co college-wide decision. Um, it, it comes out of CUNY. It's not yeah. a Hunter College decision. I, I spoke to the uh, Hunter President's office about it because yeah. it was pretty dismaying to find out that they were going to charge. And that's what they said. It's citywide, college. Um, rules now they're ch they're changing it or they did change it or they had changed it and they were still generous with us nevertheless it's a f it's one of those philosophical questions to which we have no answer and to which there might not even be one yeah they didn't explain it to us other than it, it, it was happening and so here we are uh so whoever that is thank you um uh, just a couple of really small updates. Uh, the assistant di district manager post is now online. We're starting to get applications. Uh, hopefully, we'll start doing interviews pretty soon. Um, the you'll start. We did a partnership. We're doing a partnership with Beta NYC uh, to do some some tech needs and some uh, changes uh, in the board office side. Uh, so you may see some email address, e new email addresses from folks from Beta NYC that will be doing a project with us uh, in the next few months. You probably really won't notice, but uh, it'll be a great benefit for the board office. And uh, the final note, uh, I'm, I'm very sad to announce that uh, Andrew has told us, uh, Andrew is our, our community assistant, our community associate, uh, has told us that he will be leaving the office to work in a nonprofit at the end of February. Uh, so when you see him as you leave, uh, tell him thank you for all of his hard work. Uh, he'll be around next month, so if you miss him today, but please let him know that he's appreciated and that we really appreciate all of his hard work. And we'll be posting his position online uh, whenever he's uh, done. So if, have, if you have folks in mind for either of those two positions, please do let us know and tell them to apply because uh, we're excited about you know new things. And uh, Any other questions? Then if not, thanks. Let's move on. Okay. Landmark, David, James. So while they're coming up, I just want to remind you that the Jewish Museum has withdrawn its application for now and intends to come back in February. So the only item that we have for landmarks is the 3 East 89th Street, which you heard about in the public session.
Um, we've had um, three East 89th Street originally came to us in December and then withdrew their application. They came back last, the week I guess last week. It's a fascinating application. The building has quite a social history. The resolution is quite long, but I did provide a description of the property which outlines some of the social history, who the architect was, the connection between 1083 Fifth Avenue, the former National Academy of Design, along with 3 East 89th Street, which was also part of the former National Academy of Design. Just so everyone knows, of course the gallery is open to the public the same way that Saks Fifth Avenue is open to the public. Everything is for sale. This is a commercial entity coming into what was formerly a not-for-profit space, so they have to apply for a zoning waiver to change to get that commercial use going. The application was very complicated. The 74711 component is very complicated, but it is out, all outlined for you in the resolution. The application was divided into three parts. The first two parts, the restoration component and the ground floor, the new door, the design of the, um, the, re the going back to the historic door for the origin for the entry door is in your application. Part A and Part B were unanimous. Part C, which is the part that must go to the Landmarks Commission before they can go to the City Planning Commission for the zoning waivers, um, was disapproved at the committee with one dissenting vote. So with that, um, I don't know whether people want to take the first two parts. Um, Chuck? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? With that, we'll call the roll. This is for Part A and Part B only. Now Part C, the rear and side yard enlargements and the rooftop additions, they're all laid out in the resolution. They also speak to the drum, which is at the rear of 1083 Fifth Avenue, which it's hard to explain without a, without a visual, although there is somewhat of a visual on your tablet, that it was almost an L-shaped configuration in the drum, which contains this magnificent interior staircase at 1083, looks out to the rear of 3 East 89th Street. David will speak to that. But we really felt that um, after listening to the neighbors, and there was quite a crowd there at our Landmarks Committee meeting, and listening to the applicant, that it really is too much for the building to have that one-third of additional height added on to it, plus the extension at the rear part of which is a two-story glass translucent box. And um, I'll let David speak to that. Thank you. Technically, I'm stepping away. But mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, the uh, expansion into the rear is uh, absolutely what I'll call architectural chutzpah. Um, I can't imagine that rear yard is already uh, so narrow and so tiny, uh, and uh, I think that this just makes no sense architecturally or as a piece of uh, urban thinking. But uh, what's happening is that it's not only the issue of whether this building should expand, uh, 
and fully utilize the rear yard. It's also the issue of being a good neighbor to another building which is in the historic district and was part of a three building complex. And that's the portion that has the rotunda. And as Jane pointed out, that rotunda looks to the east into what's left of the rear yard, which is 10 feet. So there are three windows, but the window that gets the most light is the one that looks to the east. If we support the rear yard enlargement, it's going to block that window. Architecture may be about form and function, which you hear all the time, but architecture is also about light and view and the play of light and shadow. And if we block that window, all of a sudden we take a beautiful space which is relying on the natural light in what should continue as a rear yard under the zoning, uh, and we all of a sudden make that a dark artificial place. So I strongly recommend that we defeat the enlargement into the rear yard. As far as the upper part, we all know that glass is not transparent and basically glass is often reflective. It too contributes to reducing the light by adding a lot of unnecessary, unnecessary bulk in that rear yard. I'm afraid we're in executive session now, so only committee members are to s allowed to speak, but if you do have a question, you could write it down yeah and give it to one of the committee members who are sitting in the first three rows. The, the board members who are in the first three rows and Excuse scattered me, about, the board members. but you can ask and then they will say something on your behalf. Jane, Marco has a question. Yes, I know. Um, Thank you. Marco. Thank you. I'm opposing this uh, project because uh, first, the height of the building. One extension, on the roof reach 78 feet. And the maximum allowed for RAV is 75. Three feet, I think, is reasonable. But then they want one more floor on the top of that, so they want to reach 88 feet. I'm opposing that. The second part is the applicant, he wants to become a polluter. He wants to put an elegant, uh, attractive uh, crystal box radiator to warm up the inside as well as the outside of the building. A polluter, very simple. Because for that reason, he needs a bigger mechanical room to occupy the required side yard and rear yard. And for that reason, I think uh, one of the issues that they raised is they are exempt of the energy cost, and that is absolutely right. However, all of us, we have the moral responsibility to protect and preserve this world for present and future generations. Yes, I am a uh, environmentalist. The last point that I would like to raise is they say that because they need to be in compliance with the American Disability Act, they need to encroach the required rear yards. Personally, myself, I don't know, David or Anthony, we always, we have to be in compliance with the American Disability Act. And we never, we never ask for a variance to encroach the required rear yard. I don't know, I do, I'm not talking for th these two colleagues. But at least myself, I never have, uh, I've never asked for that. So to claim that they need more space and to use the rear yard, the side yards, to be in compliance with the Ameri American Disability Act is wrong. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak on? No one? OK. Oh, Anthony. Um. I was the lone member of the committee uh, to vote uh, essentially in favor or to vote no to the resolution. And there are a couple of things I'd like to clarify, um, at least as to my understanding of, of, um, of some of the issues. Uh, 
in terms of, aside from floor area, in terms of uh, zoning, the issue of the side yard isn't an issue. There are no side yards required and uh, in, in this district. And so, in fact, letting the building reach its full width is not, the full width it has in the front is, is not really an issue. Um, as for the, I've heard a number of the people who spoke in opposition to this uh, speaking about the residential aspect of the project added to the, to the top. And I think that one of the things, and this is, is a bit of a misconception, I think, because that upper floor is in fact intended as a kind of artist in residence artist, that there is a program that the gallery intends to um, either begin or continue that in fact would have visiting artists come and work in the space um, of the upper floor so that um, so that their their participation in the artistic process becomes part of the community's participation um, and I think really that that was just something that I think's been lost in all of this well we're here for context and appropriate no no I understand know. that and and I understand that it's basically irrelevant but it's also part of what part of the opposition it seemed to me was based on a series of what I can only, not politely, describe as irrelevancies. And I I'm, I'm just wanted to clarify that a little bit. That's all. Thank you. Point of information. Uh, this lot is an split lot. Uh, one side is uh, on RAB, which is required uh, side yards and rear yard, <coughs> which is not in compliance today. And the other side is R10. And that's in that part is, is correct. It can be used whatever they want. Thank you. Right. Anyone else want to speak to the um, part C? Billy. I just have a question for the committee, which is, could they uh, achieve what they want with this artist in residence uh, option uh, on the top floor without going as high as they're going? Sure. Did you ask that, that come up at well, all? Well, we're today? really only here. We don't discuss the internal use of the enlargements ever. We are here for the context and appropriateness. But I think to Marco's point, they are putting in a gift shop and a cafe, and some of that space could have been utilized for other purposes. But our purview is the context and appropriateness within the historic district. And that's our, where we're coming from. Would you agree, David? Absolutely, mm -hmm. and this is very visible. <laughs> from a number of points of view, and if you look at some of the photographs. I can't hear him. I'm saying that what Jane said is absolutely correct, and the massing that's going up to 80 some odd feet is going to be visible, so above and beyond the fact of the zoning issue from the point of view of context and appropriateness in, in the uh, historic district, it's just out of scale and simply not appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Barbara. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? This is on part C. Uh, yes. It's a yes is a disapproval. Um, call the roll. Okay. Abenshun. Aronson. Yes. Ashby. Yes. Barron. Yes. Barton. Yes. Boris. Yes. Brown. Yes. Camp. Yes. Chalky. Yes. Chu. Cone? No. Dangor? Yes. Freeland? Yes. Hartzog? Yes. Helpern? Yes. Higgins? Abstain. Johnson? Yes. Yeah. Kirschenbaum? Yes. Later? Yes. Lamort? Yes. Mason? Yes. Melampi? Yes. Morris? Yes. Newman? Marshall? Yes. Patch? Yes. Boat Marshall? Yes. Popper? Yes. Price? Yes. Rudder? Yes. Salcedo? Yes. Schneider? Yes. Shimomura? Yes. Spangaletti? Squire? Yes. Tamayo? Yes. Tejo? Yes. Wald? No. Warren? Yes. Wiener? Yes. Zimmerman? Yes. Uh, Newman? She's not here. Not here? Okay. On the um, 
On the first parts A and B, there were 38 yeses, zero noes, and one abstention. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, transportation, Chuck, Craig. And I'm reminding you to mention the buses on Lexington, Craig. Should, should I do the first one? Sure. All right. Yeah, we have three resolutions and they were, we had some abstentions on the first resolution. Can you, I think you need to speak up for people in the back. Can you, yes, Tricia, you wanted to, do you want to? because I wanted to learn right. more about it. I'd like to change my view. I'm in support. Okay. Um, basically, Michelle, who's not here, she was the other abstention. Kent, can you hear? Maybe it's not up far enough. Um, this is really, this first resolution, let me just hold one second here. Let's <laughs> get This is the offset crossings, the bike lane offset crossings. This is basically has to do with the protected bike lanes on First and Second <laughs> Avenue. And if, if we could uh, hold it down there. <laughs> we don't I usually get outbursts like that. Let's just have a chance for the laptop to I know it's in. funny, but anyhow, uh, uh, well, I won't get into that. Um, any, anyway. As you know, we have the protected bike lanes. What the Department of Transportation now wants to do is on certain of the streets where they, they want to set up these offset crossing. And what that means is, what's happened now is you have the bikes and the cars, when they go to, they, here's a bike and here's a car going to make, let's say, a left turn. And they don't, they don't always mesh too well. And the, and the bikes don't feel safe. And, the cars have to be very careful. And so what the Department of Transportation is going to do, they're going to want to set it up so that there's going to be a projection out into the street so the car has to, and there'll be, there'll be just a little bit of a, a bump that the car has to slow down, go around, and make a turn to really avoid connecting with the bicycle. And, and we had a lot of testimony from bicyclists who very much are in favor of this, obviously. And I think that uh, the, the Department of Transportation has shown when they've used this in other parts of the city that it's a much safer alternative. And uh, so the committee, it was really 13 yes and a couple of abstentions. And so we had, you saw our resolution, so we're very much obviously in favor of it. Any? Any discussion? Barry? Call the question. Second. 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 Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Can we call the roll on item number, the first item? Offset crossings? Abin Chen? Yes. Aronson? Yes. Ashby? Yes. Barron? Yes. Bart Barton? Yes. Forrest? Yes. Brown? Yes. Camp? Yes. Chalky? Yes. Chu? Cone? Yes. Dang Dangor, yes. Freeland? Yes. Hartzog? Yes. Halpern? Yes. Higgins? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Kirchenbaum? Yes. Later? Yes. Lamort? Yes. Mason? Yes. Malampy? Yeah, almost four running. Malampy? He down. stepped out. Uh, Morris? Yes. Oh, Newman, here. not here. Partial? Yes. Hatch? Yes. Hope Marshall? Yes. Popper? Yes. Price? Yes. Rudder? Yes. Salcedo? Same. Schneider? Yes. Pass? Pass? You didn't faint. <coughs> oh, he said yes. Shimamura? Yes. Yes. Spagnoletti? Squire? Pass. Tamayo? Yes. Tejo? Abstain. Wald? Yes. Warren? Yes. Wiener? Yes. Zimmerman? Yes. Passes. Chu? Uh, yes. Hartsaw? Uh, abstain. Helpern? Yes. And Malampi? Abstain. 
Chuck yeah. and Craig go to the second. Wait, there's, there's two more passes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. Spag Spagnoletti? Not here. Squire? No. Okay, before we go to the second resolution on the landmarks disapproval of the, uh, of the extensions, we have 36 yeses, two noes, and one abstention. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right, item three is a discussion what was regarded a proposal that we had learned about from the borough president's office, which was um, a proposal to essentially close the south outer roadway of the 59th Street Bridge. This is the roadway um, that goes eastbound into Queens and to convert it over t into a, an ADA accessible pedestrian way. Um, we got a letter from the borough president's office supporting this proposal, which is, has been floating around, and we took it up. And as a committee, we had put forward a resolution requesting that DOT um, conduct a study to look into the essentially the feasibility of doing this and to lay out whether something like this can actually work. Currently, there is on the north outer roadway that had been converted in the past to. Um, a bike and pedestrian pathway, and there were numerous comments regarding how it is not particularly safe for anyone because the bikers are going two ways and the pedestrians end up having to um, avoid bikers who are coming in both directions and sometimes pretty fast because of the slope of the bridge. And the argument being made was that with the, with reductions in vehicular um, activity o on the bridge over the past 10 years and p congestion pricing coming in, it's likely that there are still gonna be fewer vehicles and the outer roadway is not even in service um, during all hours and there would be more utility uh, of it, a better utility um, to have it as potentially a p pedestrian walkway. So we were um, agnostic as to whether we should have this as an ADA accessible walkway or just a general um, pathway where we can talk about which side would be better for bikes versus pedestrians. Right now, um, the proposal of the borough president was that bikes would be on, on the north side and pedestrians on the south side, but that's something that also DOT would be studying if, um, if they were to do so. So that's essentially the resolution. Right, it's just, a, it's just a study. And I should also note, the Queensboro Bridge upper level is going to be, um, the, the bridge deck is going to be rehabilitated. Actually, DOT is gonna be coming into our committee next month to do a presentation or to update us on the status of that project, which is upcoming. And it could be an opportune time for them because there are gonna be closures on the bridge to actually do the study and to look at traffic volumes and to see what a more constrained roadway with um, less throughput, um, how, that would, how that would actually operate and whether that could be applied to um, the potential longer term closure of, a, of the south outer roadway. No. No. It's a different issue? No. Okay. It's, a, it's a different issue, and in fact, if this proposal were to ever come to fruition, it would open up opportunities along 59th Street where you could, in theory, perhaps reverse traffic on 59th Street between 1st First, First and 2nd Avenue so that the building that you were referencing, which is 300 East 59th, the landmark, would be able to be accessed from 1st Avenue, and you wouldn't have the issue of the new bike lane on 2nd Avenue interfering with their access. Uh, Barry. I abstained on this uh, issue only because I felt it was premature that let the study be done and let, let the DOT come to us with a proposal that we can vote on rather than saying, hey, you got a great dream here. Uh, we think it's terrific and we're not going to wake you from the dream at this time. I think it's premature. The last paragraph in the minutes pretty well states my position. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Um, Michael and then Paul. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, this is just for my own 
Sanity, how much of the Fifth Street Bridge is part of Community Board Acres? Well, technically, yeah, technically all of it because it's. It's going to be done in conjunction with like the Community Board on the Queen side of the bridge, or it would be. Into that? It would be done in conjunction with um, with definitely um, CB6 south of us. Um, I imagine that at some point Queens uh, would be brought into it as well because any changes to the bridge would require changes on the Queens side in Long Island City um, to. Uh, as they had as they did in order to provide better bike access to the existing bikeway they'd have to do the same thing on the south side in order to improve the connections there to the existing sidewalk network and pedestrian network yes what's the current state of the proposal is like whose proposal it is what the study is currently ongoing there's no study ongoing the this idea um, we received a letter from the borough president's office in regards to this proposal and their support of it, and we decided to bring it forward as something that is obviously going to come up at some point. What we learned throughout this is that DOT is doing a traffic study um, as they are preparing to and as they will be closing or, or um, restricting access on the south outer roadway, whatever it may be during that construction project. We asked them to look at this specific proposal and how that could work in conjunction with, with the traffic study that they're already going to be doing. Russell, the one thing that's clear is that you have bikes and pedestrians with very little room, and their bikes going two ways, and uh, there's a real danger for the pedestrians. So something ne really needs to be done if you're going to, you know, have bikes and pedestrians. Uh, going over the bridge and you are so this is this a study to figure out the best way to <clears throat> deal with that no not the traffic study they're doing now no no wait Paul and then Valerie so I just want to say I'm in full support of the study being done I've, I've gone over that bridge in both directions uh, both as a pedestrian and as a bicyclist and the the, the, the space there is just, it's too narrow. It's narrow, too narrow for just one bike, let alone allowing these spaces for a bike and for a pedestrian. And I'll give you an example. As a pedestrian, having walked that bridge coming up from the Manhattan side, it's confusing, first of all, because when I walked up the bridge, the right side of the bridge, my, my inclination as a walker is to right, walk on the right side of the street, uh, walk, walk on the white, right side of the sidewalk. And as I walked up the bridge, I'm on the right side, which is actually coming down. So I actually was not only in danger of myself being hit by a bike, but I became uh, an issue for the person who was on their bike because they had to basically slow down and swerve to the opposite direction of where I was at. Um, and, and really, as, as, and so as a pedestrian, it's really unsafe for me, particularly when if I'm walking up the bridge or walking down whatever way. Um, if I want to pass somebody who's in front of me as a walker, then I have to walk into a lane where there could be a speeding bike coming down. And then as a bicyclist, it's just dangerous for me, especially going down, whether you're going towards the Queens or the Manhattan Way. Once you're coming down the bridge, there's such high speeds that even if you have great brakes, it's very dangerous if, if there's a walker in your way and you have to try to swerve out of the way and there's just no space to do that. So I would be just in total support of just making this happen rather than doing a study, but I get the processes. So I'm in full support of doing this and, and potentially hopefully open it up, much like the William, I think it's the Williamsburg Bridge where they actually have it separated for bikes and for pedestrians in a way that it makes everybody safe. And you know, you, have, you know where you're at, you don't have to worry about hitting pedestrians. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I abstained on this one. I just don't understand, what, and I agree with Barry, that I mean, this is completely premature. If the DOT is doing a traffic study and it's not looking at this bridge as part of that, then that study is, is incomplete in any event. Right. So I don't even understand why we would be promoting yet another study that the DOT is not going to conduct in a, in, a, in a regular fashion. I would be more in favor if the motion was that it was combined as part of the study that they're currently doing. So just, I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear on this. I think you're referencing the, the east side um, traffic study that's already taking place. When the borough president's office working with Bike New York um, were, were developing this proposal, 
they went to DOT and DOT acknowledged that as part of the overall bridge project, separate from the York Avenue traffic study and separate from the east side traffic study that's taking place in the 60s, um, that they're going to be looking at bridge volumes and bridge traffic in particular and noting how things change as a result of, of any closures that are going to be t taking place as a result of the bridge deck rehabilitation. So it's a separate component from As a, as a you know traffic flow or rehabilitation project, why, how could they not be considering that as part of the bridge rehab when they know that it's being used and they know the narrowness of each side? And again, I don't see how why it should be separate in the context <coughs> of looking at congestion <coughs> pricing and what's happening going to happen on that bridge. I mean, it just seems like it is it's maybe premature is not word, but the right word, but. Why would it be separated out as a separate study? It can't be done in a vacuum without looking at all these other things. And I don't think it would be done in a vacuum. I think DOT has to take into account all the other projects that are taking why place. Is, why, why, would they, they, why wouldn't they say that when DOT stood up to talk about it? So what we're, what we're asking for here is to build off of just the, the traffic analysis they're doing and asking them to go a step further into assess feasibility and to come up with concepts for this to actually potentially be implemented. But I think we're asking for money to be spent on a separate study that is not, I'm not saying needless, that would be either duplicative or part of no. a real look at the, re of no. the bridge itself. No, we're asking them to take the information they're going to get and look specifically at doing something about these bike paths and study that. That's the whole idea. It's not, a, it's not, they're not planning on doing it now, Valerie. We want them to do it. If they're not planning on doing it, then anything else they're doing is completely ridiculous. Okay. But we so want to, I, I mean, well, but we why, want so to make them less ridiculous. That's well, our okay. goal. <laughs> well, no, we can never make them less ridiculous than I mean, they already are. Well, no matter how hard we try. Well, we try I don't know. That's a high it. standard, but we're trying to reach it. Take that. No, okay. But I don't think we should be, I, I just okay. don't see the efficacy of this. Okay. Yeah, man. Yeah, just as a point about safety, uh, I kind of want to reiterate what Paul said. It is a safety concern. I walk over that bridge quite a bit. Um, and it's not just bikes and people who are walking or jogging or running. I've seen people on like literally mopeds yeah. coming down that side of the bridge. And um, people who should probably be in, you know, with the rest of their traffic use that because it's a lot quicker to get across. So in terms of a safety point of view, I think it's uh, something to be considered to at least study it. Thank you. Sharon? Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, can we call roll on item, I guess it's- Angel John. Yes. Aaron. <coughs> yes. Ashby. Yes. Barrett. Yes. Barton. Yes. Warren. Yes. Brown. Yes. Camp. Yes. Shockey. Yes. yeses, one no, and five abstentions. Um, that was the one about the offset. Three lanes. offset crossings. Yeah. All right, thank you, Alita. Thank you. All right, and now on to congestion pricing. Um, th those of you who were here last month may recall that I referenced that we would be discussing this and that the purpose of this discussion was not to relitigate congestion pricing, but to actually try to do the grunt work and try to address the issues that we're concerned about as per the implementation of it 
and the lack of information that we have at this point, we don't have any sense of what the policies are, go are going to be because they haven't been developed. But we also don't know how local um, entities that are active stakeholders in this, such as New York City DOT, New York City Transit, and the MTA are actively preparing as well. And just to go back to the Queensboro Bridge as a reference, we know that there are going to be impacts based on however they decide to to, um, determine tolling um, policies, especially in regards to access to the 59th Street Bridge. Because as you may know, if you're accessing the lower roadway from 2nd Avenue, well, you're technically crossing past 60th but not getting into 59th Street. So if they don't put the easy pass readers in front of the bridge, people will not be paying to access the bridge if they're coming down 2nd Avenue. However, if they want to access the, the upper roadway, they have to cross into the congestion zone. And one of the questions, of course, is, well, will those people have to pay the fee, or will it be reversed out if, they, if, if they're able to determine that a driver is literally crossing into the zone just to exit the zone? Um, we don't have that answer. If that doesn't happen, then it's likely to change um, um, the um, way that drivers behave in terms of the routes they take and it may create additional stresses on second avenue and that may result in other potential impacts in terms of perhaps you need to change signals signal timing parking regulations what and things of that nature so we thought it was the time with less than a year potentially until the january 1st um, 2021 um, likely start date to start to actually compile these questions and to try to address the issues at hand. So in discussing this, there are a few different pieces. So um, we have one resolution that, speci that specifically addresses one of our major concerns, and this is something that, that was um, brought up before, and that is the representation on the, on the what's it called, the Traffic Mobility Review Panel, I believe it's called. This is the state panel that is going to be essentially determining the um, policies and the fee structures. And we are requesting that there be Manhattan representation on this panel to represent our interests. In fact, we're asking for two Manhattan representatives, one from, from areas above the uh, north of the congestion zone, north of 60th Street, um, and, and one south of 60th Street to represent the various interests and issues that each of those areas are going to um, have to face in their own unique way. Um, beyond that, I distributed a letter before, and this is a letter that essentially synthesizes all of the questions that have come up so far that we're planning on sending out to elected officials. Now, I just want to acknowledge, I put this together very quickly earlier today, so there are typos in there, and this is only a draft right now, we'll fix it um, afterwards, but I just wanted to make sure that I reference that, and if there's anything that anyone believes should be added in terms of questions that need to be asked, I, I want to pr provide that opportunity right now. Um, but the resolution itself was a unanimous resolution, and as Alita mentioned, we are going to um, have a, t a congestion pricing task force to continue this work, because this is something that we're hoping to continue as we move along throughout the course of the year because this is probably the biggest transportation issue facing our community um, in the upcoming year. So with that, if there are any questions, um, Sarah. Um, Craig, I read this quickly, so I don't know if this was already addressed in one of your questions, but um, I'd like to uh, add, add a question or include um, some discussion about disparate economic impact because people who live in transportation deserts will be disparately impacted. They're the ones who can't hear you. I know. And, people talk. Um, and people who maybe work late nights, um, especially at our hospitals, um, may be safer driving home than waiting hours and hours. Not hours, but waiting for a long time for trips. Yeah, I think we could add a question on that um, in the section um, where we uh, make requests um, for answers from the Traffic Mobility Review Board and how they determine the pricing. I believe, if I recall, the law that was passed included language that would provide um, exclusions or discounts for l certain lower income populations, but that, 
those policies or the specifics as to how that would work obviously haven't been announced yet, but I believe there is a provision in there for certain populations, but anything else, and I do mention in here exclusions and offsets and discounts and such, that's something that we already are asking, but we could clarify that. Um, over here, Russell. I have a question to, ask, uh, to potentially add, which is if we're thinking it's gonna potentially be a largely camera-based enforcement system, what privacy protections are there gonna be in place? I mean, what sort of protections to ensure that you know, we're not turning all of Manhattan into like a surveillance state because there are going to be cameras on every corner to make sure, you know, who's driving in and who's driving out and what the permitted use is going to be for law enforcement and what have you in terms of uh, how the cameras are going to be used. And then the second point I was going to raise is just potential friendly amendment if the chairs will entertain it is in the resolution if we say uh, at least two representatives and say at least one from above 60th Street, at least one from below 60th Street, I don't know if you're willing to uh, go along with that. But it's just, uh, I think the challenge there is there's one representative that's going to be appointed from the Long Island Railroad region and one representative appointed from the Metro North region. So there are only six people on this panel. And based on the, um, the, appoint the appointers, um, I'm trying to remember specifically who it is. I don't know that there's even the ability, because the mayor only has one appoint, appointee that he could put on. So getting two may very well be a stretch. I think trying to get more than that is going to be n unsuccessful. <coughs> yeah. Um, I have two questions. The first is the t is to s ask if you might consider some friendly amendment tweaks to the questions. Um, I was curious if some of them could be, uh, instead of will the traffic, the traffic review mobility board decision making process be done in a transparent fashion, something like how will that be made in a transparent fashion, or um, will there be public input, how will there be public input opportunities in terms of like a more collaborative approach with our elected officials, and also sort of instead of giving, asking them a yes or no question, asking them a question that requires them to actually give us some detailed information that is important to us. Yeah, we can definitely okay. do that. Then my second question is just, maybe I totally mis misheard, but it sounded like Audrey in her report from Liz Kruger's office like talked about this letter, and I just wanted to make clear, like this, maybe it was a different letter, or maybe she just saw it, no, no one? Heard that as well. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. Vanessa, the, um, I believe she did reference this letter because I handed it out as she was waiting to. Oh, maybe just we have to be careful about that, right? Because we want to make sure, like, especially this says we passed this in January and while the committee passed it. Right. Yeah. So that, that's why the draft watermark is on there. That's why I was confused while it was happening. So I appreciate the draft watermark, but we'll just try to maybe touch base with her yeah. to make sure that that's really crystal clear. But this is not the final copy. All right. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. Um, Peter. I do want to second what you just said. I thought that was a good suggestion before moving to the questions. I strongly endorse the letter. I want to congratulate you on the points raised. I think they're extremely important and substantive. And I don't have a lot of confidence in a, you know, a, a panel of six people giving the required level of thought. Um, Rita. I think you did an incredible job. The only thing I'd like to add is that we talk about this, and I think that we need a visual. Right. I I, I didn't know how to best put that in in here because I thought this that was less policy as opposed to something else. It's in the minutes, and we can definitely find a way of asking that. I think it's important. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, Valerie, and then. Okay. Sharon. I just think it. it really comprehensive. I would just make two points. The first one is I think you assume you, you only talk about drivers and I think you should ask the question as to whether fees will be charged to other vehicles, meaning two-wheel vehicles, whether they're motorcycles, because when I went to the public hearing at the borough president, there was a big lobby that <coughs> motorcyclists were trying to get themselves exempted from the congestion pricing. And I still think we should consider, since this is really a tax to promote public transportation, 
whether some fees should be charged even to bicyclists who are coming into the congestion zone. And the second thing is, I think we should ask a question that when actually congestion pricing is implemented, that the additional tax that the taxis on the Upper East Side and Upper West Side are paying should go away. And we should get pin people down on that. We've, we handled, okay. we've handled that separately in a different resolution, and that is a separate issue because that doesn't relate to the congestion zone south of 60th Street. So we want to keep that separate. But why shouldn't we just put it in a comprehensive list of questions? I don't see why you would be against that. Because I think it conflates the issues here, and it doesn't relate to the implementation of, of the fee south of 60th Street. That's a, that's a separate piece of the, of the underlying legislation, and we've handled it separately, and we have a resolution that was passed dealing with that specific matter. I mean, can we just say, please refer to our separate resolution on the other tax we're paying? I mean. Again, I just don't know that they're connected. They're not? One is called a congestion pricing fee, and we're going to ignore it? It is connected. It, they're, but not, a, not as it relates to the answers that we're seeking right now. I, 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 I thought about that as, as I was putting this together, and I just didn't, I just didn't think that, that it was going to be a productive component to this, given that we're, we're really looking at how are things going to be done over the next year in order to make sure we're ready for January 1st, 2021. We're not even looking beyond that at this point in terms of depending on how congestion pricing is implemented and how successful or unsuccessful it is, what we're going to be requesting next. And, and the $2.50 congestion fee we're, uh, on, on um, yellow taxis, we're requesting that that be, that, that be reversed now. We don't want to wait until after, t after implementation. Okay. Karen. Yes, um, I a fantastic re uh, resolution. In fact, the, the minutes are just um, outstanding as well. I just have one uh, suggestion, and I was wondering whether or not the, the last sentence uh, on, on this, uh, the last sentence reads, one from above 60th and one from below 60th. Since this is a citywide uh, committee, that we're asking representation on. Do you think, and, and I, I know that this is coming from Community Board 8, but do you think we need to specify uh, one from the east side, above, uh, below 90s, uh, below, do you, do you think that at least, do you think that we should have do you think that we should specify at least east side? Because the way that I'm looking at this, I know it's coming from Community Board A, but if I didn't know it was coming from Community Board A, it could be you know, on the 60th Street on the west side. So I was just wondering whether or not we should specify it. I, I'm not sure that it, substantively going to make a difference in terms of how it's, how, I, think, I think it's clear that it's a community board eight letter and therefore I, you can infer that we're hopeful that it's someone from here, but if it were someone from the, from the Upper West Side, then they'd share many of the same. <laughs> yeah. Peggy. Yeah, Peggy. Uh, yes, hi. On this. Um, the one thing that I had been hearing, um, though, that there does seem to be some concern that uh, about the environmental impact on our community from perhaps more cars not going south but staying um, in the uh, Upper East Side. And I wondered whether we should have something in here about monitoring the um, environmental effect. Um, I think we could probably put something in there. I think that, that could be helpful. I'm not clear as to how they currently are doing air monitoring and, and how you'd be able to compare it. We did ask for them to do assessments and modeling in regards to 
uh, essentially I was saying looking at current conditions versus expected conditions and that would obviously continue afterwards. But we could, I think, put something in here to talk about the environmental needs. I think it's a relevant point. Yeah, Russell? So one other uh, point, I guess, if, and this is also partly a question. I mean, it's sort of not clear to me whether the idea is that two out of the six are going to be from Manhattan, or were I saying that we need more people, like we need to add two people to the committee? Yeah, yeah so, so I, I just pulled up my notes. So the six-person panel, it's going to be one mayoral appoint, appointee, one uh, from the MTA representing the Long Island Railroad service area, one from the MTA representing the Metro North service area, and then the other three are coming from the governor. So, the idea is basically, so you can't expand six. Yeah, and that's the, that's the power, right, that's, that's set in stone. This would be a change to the law also, so it just seems to me that if we're talking about changes to the... No, we're not changing, no. The governor can appoint anybody he wants, and we're just saying, in his three appointments, we want two from Manhattan. That's basically what we're saying. Or one from the mayor or one from the governor. Or one from the mayor. Okay, so between the appointing authorities, they should just, you know, right. work it out. Right. Okay. Nick? I have a quick question. Sorry, um, this fee, the congestion pricing, is it uh, 24 hours a day? We don't know for sure. I think there's. Uh, it's something that the that the that the traffic mobility review review board will determine. Um, other cities don't necessarily have it 24 hours, or if they do, there are steep discounts for evenings and weekends. Um, so it could be variable, and that's one of the things that we'll learn. But there is a possibility that that evenings, late evenings, overnight periods may not have tolls assessed. We just don't know yet. All right, anything else? Oh, anyway. All the questions. Second. 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 All, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> all the roll. roll. Okay, Abenshin? Yes. Aronson? Yes. Ashby? Yes. Barron? Yes. Barton? Yes. Boris? Yes. Brown? Yes. Camp? Yes. Chucky? Yes. Chu? Yes. Cohn? Yes. Jangor? Yes. Friedland? Yes. Hartsog? Yes. Helpern? Yes. Higgins? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Kirschenbaum? Yes. Later? Yes. Lamort? Yes. Mason? Yes. Malampi? Yes. Morris? Yes. Newman? Marshall? Yes. Patch? Yes. Pope Marshall? Yes. Popper? Yes. Price? Yes. Rudder? Yes. Salcedo? Yes. Schneider? Yes. <coughs> yes. Shimamura? Yes. Spagnoletti? Squire? Yes. Tamayo? Yes. Tejo? Yes. Wald? Yes. Warren? Yes. Wiener? Yes. Zimmerman? Yes. And Helper, were you a pastor or a yes? I said yes. This is twice. I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll mark you down once. Okay. On the Queensboro Bridge resolution, there were 34 yeses, four noes, and one abstention. And I want to mention that now that we have a resolution in favor of two Manhattan representatives, I intend to uh, submit that to the borough president's office for distribution to all of the other boards in Manhattan, who I believe from the last borough board meeting will be in favor of also asking for two Manhattan representatives on the panel. So we'll have, again, a community-based, a Manhattan community-wide based referendum on this particular issue. Thank the, you. The borough president already sent a letter Right, the borough on president did, but this is to get well, all of the no, community No, no, I know, yeah. get them all, but Yeah, so yeah. we're all aligned. Yeah. And before we step aside, Alita wanted me to mention one other piece of news, um, and this is extremely frustrating. So this past Thursday, um, the community board office um, received a letter from New York City Transit um, regarding upcoming service changes taking effect in April on bus routes. And among the changes that were being proposed included some reductions on the M101, 102, and 103, the bus routes that serve Third Avenue and Lexington Avenue. Now, they're not, they're not going to be major reductions, but we don't have a sense of how many buses it's going to be that they're proposing to take away. It's going to be, at, at times, from 10-minute frequencies going to 12-minute frequencies, or 12-minute frequencies going to 15-minute frequencies during certain periods of time. Um, that's all the information we have. Unfortunately, 
as I said, the letter was received Thursday afternoon, giving us little time to respond given that the public hearing took place on Tuesday with Monday being the holiday. So we did quickly write a letter and we sent it out. So we raised our objections, our strong objections, and especially given the fact that they just put in the Lexington Avenue bus lane and given the impending arrival of congestion pricing, we explained how this is the most inopportune time to reduce service and if anything, especially with the new bus lane, you wanna add service to be able to promote the fact that buses are now theoretically moving faster and providing better service and more reliable service. So I just want to note that um, and I don't know what our next steps are, but we'll see if they uh, move forward with that. <coughs> Valerie was bemoaning the, the DOT we give you the MTA, and then some. I not, spoke, not quite. I spoke to Paul Goebel, who's Gail Brewer's transportation guy, who got in touch on Friday. I spoke to him with the MTA about the ridiculousness of cutting service immediately after the Institute bus lanes in advance of congestion pricing with very little notice for public hearing. I also contacted both city council members' offices, and I believe that Kana from Keith Power's office also got in touch um, with the MTA and the DOT on this. So it, uh, we have the support of the elected officials. It's just the city agencies don't always um, step in the right line. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for remembering, thank you, everyone. Craig. Oh, and the last thing is on the last resolution on congestion pricing, we have a unanimous 39 yeses and zero noes. Okay, uh, so now we have, where are we? Street Life, Abraham. All right, hi everyone. Uh, we have a couple of things tonight for Street Life. All of the applications that came before us at the meet, meeting were uh, unanimous, uh, unanimous DCA and SLA. Uh, Ed, do you want to do the honors? Yeah, all of the you, want, you want to take all of the unanimous together? Yeah. Okay, second, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so please call the roll on all of the motions, um, recommendations together. Robinson? Yes. Aronson? Yes. Ashby? Yes. Barron? Yes. Barton? Yes. Forrest? Yes. Brown? Yes. Camp? Yes. Chalky? Yes. Two? Yes. Cone? Yes. Dangler? Yes. Freeland? Yes. Parsons? Yes. Halpern? Yes. Higgins? Yes. <coughs> Johnson? Yes. Kirshenbaum? Yes. Slater? Yes. Lamore? Yes. Beaton? Yes. Lampy? Yes. Morris? Yes. Newman, not here. Partial? Yes. Patch? Yes. Pope Marshall? Yes. Popper? Yes. Price? Yes. Rudder? Yes. Salcedo? Yes. Schneider? Yes. Shimamora? Yes. Mark, <laughs> sorry. Fagnoletti? Squire? Yes. Samaya? Squire. Yes. Fado? Yes. Wald? Yes. Warren? Yes. Wiener? Yes. Zimmerman. Yes. Okay, while that's being tallied, I'd like to draw your attention to section six, this is the layovers. Um, so for various reasons, applicants will lay over either for, for a reason or they don't respond to our invitation. So we had three items, um, item six D, E, and F, that had not appeared before the committee and they're actually, the due date for a response from us uh, is going to occur before the next Street Life Committee. Um, so we made one final invitation for them to um, appear. So item 60 did appear. They spoke at the public session. That's for Orsay Restaurant. Uh, that's a sidewalk cafe application. So we have a couple of options. We can either, someone can make a motion to approve it because they came. Uh, we can disapprove it or we can take no action. Uh, Chuck. Move to approve. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so this would be to approve 6D Orsay Restaurant for their sidewalk. Uh, cafe application. Please call the roll. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Abenshaw. Yes. Aronson. Yes. Ashby. Yes. Barron. Yes. Barton. Yes. Forrest. Yes. Brown. Camp. Yes. Chalky. Yes. Chu. Yes. Cone. Yes. Dangor. Yes. Freeland. Yes. Parsons. Yes. Helper. Yes. Higgins. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Kirschenbaum. Yes. Later. Yes. Lamort. Yes. Mason. Yes. 
Pope Marshall. Yes. Popper. Yes. Price. Yes. Rudder. Yes. Salcedo. Yes. Schneider. Yes. Kimomura. Yes. Spanuletti. No. Squire. Yes. Tamayo. Yes. Tejo. Yes. Wall. Yes. Warren. Yes. Wiener. Yes. Zimmerman. Yes. Okay, now as regards to items 6, E, and F, uh, they did not respond to our invitation, um, and for the most part, if we do not have applicants up here, even though they're longstanding uh, members of the community, uh, we will take the position that we would disapprove, but someone would have to make a motion uh, to do so or to take no action. Marco? Motion to disapprove. Second. 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 Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? So then that's going as a motion to disapprove 6, E, and F. Okay, Abenson. Thank you. Yes. Aronson. Yes. Ashby. Yes. Barron. Yes. Barton. Yes. Forrest. Yes. Brown. Camp. Yes. Chalky. Yes. Chu. Yes. Cohn. Yes. Bangor. Yes. Freeland. Yes. Hartsog. Yes. Helper. Yes. Higgins. No. Johnson. Yes. Kirschenbaum. Yes. Later. Yes. Lamort. Yes. Mason. Mason. Yes. Ellis. Yes. Lampy. Yes. Morris. Yes. Newman. Partial. Yes. Hatch. Yes. Pope Marshall. Yes. Popper. Yes. Price. Yes. Rudder. Yes. Salcedo. Yes. Schneider. Yes. Shimomura. Yes. Squire. Yes. Tamaya. Yes. Tejo. Wald? Yes. Warren? Yes. Wiener? Yes. Zimmerman? Yes. Tejo? Abstain. Abstain. Can I ask Abraham a question? Sure. Abraham? Yes. Abraham? I, I sent you a picture a while ago. I think it's a few, but specifically the one I'm talking about is on 2nd Avenue between 86th and 87th Street. There's been a uh, structure that should be a um, a newspaper Are stand that's never book? been opened. Are you done? Um, and I, I, I don't, I mean, it's something yeah. that your committee would look into or? So we, we've made a couple of inquiries, but there's, as president, again, okay, there's a couple of different agencies. The CDC doesn't actually track whether things, the, the newsstands are open. <coughs> so we're trying to figure out how to get that be like a thing that they're monitoring, whether we have to highlight them, flag them to them, um, because they don't actually once that it's approved to be placed there, there's no further follow up as to monitoring. Did we approve? I don't remember coming in front of us. Did we approve that? I'd have to go back and check. Okay. I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay, on the uh, unanimous street life resolutions from the committee, there are 39 yeses, zero noes, and zero abstentions, zero not voting for cause, and the same for the approval of the applicant who came to the full board meeting this evening, 37 yeses, zero noes. Billy is tallying the rest. Um, while he, well. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Yeah. We're recalculating as the DPS does. And while um, he's doing that, we have a matter of old business. Barry has some interesting good news to share. Good evening and happy new year. Item nine on your tablet is a photo of the Hall and Mirror and the pool and rink. And I got, we received this letter from Lane Adonisio, the Assistant Vice Chair, President for Planning, Central Park Conservancy. All went well in the public design hearing on Tuesday. The commission was extremely enthusiastic about the project and unanimously approved the design. Nielsen, the president of the commission, said it was the greatest project I've ever seen and I've been here a long time, quite a moment. They didn't have a quorum, unfortunately. Two commissioners had to leave before we were finished presenting, so they will put it on the contest agenda for a full vote next week. Thanks again for your support of Community Board 8. Okay, um, on the last resolution on the applicants that did not appear despite invitations, we have 36 yeses, zero noes, and two abstentions. For new business, we were invited to pass a resolution opposing or objecting to and wanting to change the term limit requirement now under the city charter from the last year, 2018. So I've, um, the request was to pass a resolution in favor of no term limits for community board members. 
It was Tricia? It was from the borough president's office. Thank you. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, call the question. Yes? Sure. Are we voting on? We're voting on trying to get rid, and I don't have the language for this, trying to get rid of the term limit new requirement for community board members. We all voted on last year in the elections. Yeah. That's, that's, that's sure correct, that's but this is, that's right. But the, these are resolutions from the community boards who I assume opposed, I, at least we had, we had from the, from the Charter Commission Task Force, we had permission, we had resolutions from the board upholding our objection to the imposition of term limits. So this community board opposed term limits from the beginning with the 2018 mayor appointed city charter revision commission. Does that make sense? Right. No, we're not overriding them. We're just asking that the they city, it potentially that the city charter. council have another look at it. Right. They have to amend the charter. Right. I don't know if the city council can do that without without another vote on the charter. Right? I don't I don't know either, but it's not it's not my idea. So I defer to the That's true. That didn't turn out that well for Okay. So call the roll, someone? Yeah. Um Mr. Chen? No. Aaronson? No. No? No. Ashby? Yes. Yes. Barron? Yes. Barton? Yes. Flores? No. Brown? Camp? Yes. Shockey? Yes. Chu? No. Pass. Cone? Yes. Bangor? Yes. Freeland? Yes. Hartzog? Yes. Halpern? Yes. Higgins? No. Johnson? Pass? Yes. Yes, sorry. Kirchenbaum? Pass. Later? Pass. Lamore? No. Mason? Yes. Melanthi? No. Morris? No. Marshall? Yes. Pass? That's right. Yes. Pope Marshall? Yes. Popper? Yes. Price? Yes. Rudder? Yes. Salcedo? Yes? Yes. yes. Sorry. Schneider? Yes. Chimamora? Yes. Sagnoletti? Squire? No. Tamayo? No. Teo? Can you confirm the exact language that we're voting on? I, I would, I don't have exact language. I would guess that it's language to to abolish the term limit. Repeal the term Repe limit. Thank you. Repeal the term limit for community board members. No. Walls? Yes. Warren? Yes. Wiener? Yes. Zimmerman? No. Okay, passes. Brown? Not here. Chu? Chu? I, I know, I don't know yet. Okay. No. <laughs> Kirschenbaum? No. Later? No. Chu. legislation um, legalizing or authorizing e-bikes and e-scooters rolled into one. When it came up in 2019, I believe in the winter, 
we passed a resolution asking when we thought it was going before the city council, asking the city council to unbundle the legislation so each piece, both e-bikes and e-scooters could be looked at separately. So while that resolution is not coming up today because it will be something that the transportation committee will look at, I'm just suggesting that if you're interested in talking to the governor's office on the basis that you can extrapolate from the city council to the state that maybe you want to do that because this could be very fast if it's in the governor's budget. I don't really understand how Albany politics work, except that putting things in the budget gives a lot of authority. The end of the month. Okay, well anyway, we'll be in the Transportation Committee. So if you're interested, come to the meeting. This is chair of the Finance Committee in the Senate. Right, but it, yeah, they still have to pass things, but I don't really know how it works once he gets the thing in the budget. He doesn't get it except if they vote for it. Right. right, but people don't, it's not a line item veto, so you pass the budget, you pass the idea. Okay, on the term limits, we have 24 yeses, 13 noes, and one abstention, and zero not voting for cause. Thank you guys for staying. And we all can vote that for cause. <laughs> and that's true, we do. It's not a financial interest, though. No financial interest. If it's a financial interest, it's a problem. Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? Any opposition? Okay, thank you. See you guys soon.